few years ago, my birth mum overdosed. She was put in the ICU. And in the beginning, they gave us hope that maybe she'd be able to live, but just have to learn to walk or talk again. But shortly this changed, and she was put on life support, and time started to dwindle. For almost a week, my sister and I drove back and forth to the hospital, almost an hour and a half away. Staying till very late hours at night, I, being the oldest, was helping everyone feel better and soothing my younger siblings, the youngest being 10. I was around 21 or 22 at the time, now 25. Last night, I stayed and my sister left. My adoptive mom said she'd pick me up. In this time alone, I spent with my birth mom. I brushed her hair, I held her hand, talked to her, told her I loved her, and then completely lost it. I cried harder than I ever cried. I hadn't eaten all day. It was finally hitting me. Finally, I went home. That night, I had a dream of my birth mom telling me thank you, how much she loved me, and goodbye. I was confused, but I told my siblings and my grandma. That same night, they all had a dream of her as well. Without knowing, my sisters and I drove to the hospital, thinking we still had time. And as we got there, we learned she had passed. She had actually visited us all to say goodbye to each of us. Every single one of us had different dreams, but the same message. Following this, my grandma found white feathers in her closet. My grandpa went to his hunting shack and found a note she had written months before and went back to his truck to hear, You Are My Sunshine. The original by Johnny Cash, playing on a radio. A song that she had sung to us for many years. And I should note that our family is very spiritual, not so religious, and we've all been very open and had the gift of the third eye, so we knew her energy would be strong. But following, my pictures would start to fall off my wall. I've had multiple dreams of her visiting, so vivid and I could just feel her presence around me. Even years later, she sends me messages to get my attention. Just the other day, she changed my radio station multiple times and visits me in my dreams. She's gone, but she's so very much still here. So growing up, I lived in a house that had a cemetery from the 1800s behind it. Along with this, in my side yard, you could still see the fountain from where a school house burnt down. I used to sleep in this one room and every single night I would have nightmares, wake up screaming and I'd see a man with a top hat standing in my door frame, staring at me. And sometimes I'd see a little girl in a white dress sitting on my bed. I remember one night when I was little, the girl was sitting on my bed and I was screaming to have my mom come in the room. And she looked at me and told me like, shh. And as soon as my mom reached the doorway, the girl disappeared. Every night in that bedroom, I would have recurring nightmares. Wake up, see the people, and then when my mom would reach my bedroom, they would disappear. And I would often be extremely exhausted, even at like six years old, and complain to my family that they kept me up and wanted to play. I've also heard a legend that when seeing a little girl in a white dress and man in top hat means that there's distress and that this is a common pair of spirits to come. Along with this, at about age 11 or 12, I decided to switch bedrooms across the hall. After this, the occurrences almost completely stopped. There's also been multiple times that my mom would be downstairs doing laundry and think that all of my siblings, there were six of us, I was adopted and I was young while they were all teenagers. We're up and people are running up and down the hallway and she would get upstairs and everyone was sleeping. Multiple people have heard babies crying, seen little children and weird stuff will happen like lights flickering, phones ringing but nobody would be there, wind chimes moving inside the house or spinning around super fast, pictures falling off the walls and like you just could just feel a presence walking down the hall in between those two bedrooms especially. It's super spooky there, and 25 years later, I still get creeped out at night there. Everyone who has been there, even for short periods of time, will tell you they felt it. It's just there. (laughs) 
I live in an apartment with my boyfriend. Nobody other than him or myself has a key to our home, and we always lock the door and door chain before we go to bed. So last night, when we were in bed, I was having a lot of trouble sleeping. This is pretty common for me. And I ended up just scrolling on my phone for a bit while my boyfriend was asleep next to me. He didn't get up at all during this time, and neither did I. Before I knew it, it was 3am, and I knew I had to try to get some sleep. I wanted to get some water though, so I walked out to our living area, and sitting in the middle of our coffee table was a lit candle. Now at first glance, I didn't think anything of it. We usually have a candle lit in the evening, and even though I 100% saw my boyfriend blow it out before we went to bed, I'm aware that candles can actually relight themselves. However, when I walked up to blow it out, I stopped in my tracks. This is not a candle we have ever lit. In fact, its usual place is not even on my coffee table. It's been sitting on another shelf with the lid on since I moved in. But it was in the centre of my coffee table lit, with the lid sitting right next to it. And oddly enough, with no light nearby. I blew out the candle and got some water, and decided I would ask my boyfriend about it in the morning. Maybe he chose to light that candle the previous day, and I just didn't notice. But the next day I asked him about it, and he said no. He specifically remembered lighting and blowing out the candle we always use. We're both just confused. Neither of us have ever slept or walked as far as I know. And that would even be hard for me to believe, because I was awake the entire night up until then. And I definitely didn't hear anyone in the apartment. I will also say, this is the only time anything else of the ordinary has happened here. The only other weird thing is that my boyfriend and I have both been having very vivid, strange dreams recently. We even talked about it a couple nights prior, and thought it was weird that it started happening to both of us at the same time. One day, I was driving to meet my sister for lunch in a city in Northern Virginia, about an hour from my house. It was raining outside and I had pretty much no tread on my tires, but I didn't know that at the time. Anyway, I had to take an exit onto a busy highway. If you've ever driven in Northern Virginia, you'll know the traffic is absolutely terrible because of all the commuting people do from DC. As I was turning slash merging onto the highway, my car completely lost traction and I started spinning. I spun onto the highway, all the while just clutching my steering wheel and hoping for the best, as I had absolutely no control. I ended up stopping in the middle of the highway, facing the direction of oncoming traffic. Here's the weird part. When this happened, there was not a single car on either side of the road, not a single car in sight. Without thinking, I drove my car straight, the opposite direction of traffic, until I reached a patch of grass. I kid you not, the second my car was out of the way, cars were flying down the road again, hundreds of them. It was an extremely busy road once more. My sister even passed me, called me, and asked if it was me parked in the grass. I immediately started crying because I was suddenly overwhelmed with the severity of what had just happened. Had the traffic been what it normally was during my accident, I would have surely been hit head on and most likely killed. I still cannot explain what happened to me to this day. It was like a glitch in the system. Obviously, it could have just been an extremely lucky coincidence. However, I drive this road quite frequently and have never ever seen this highway with not a single car in sight. And somehow, there was nobody for the entire duration of my accident. If anyone has ever experienced anything similar, please let me know. My mum used to go to some kids' house for after school. She helped them study, and this girl she taught moved houses several times. One time, she moved to this big, really old palace with many, many stairs, and her apartment was like on the fifth floor, which is pretty high for an Italian building, so my mom had to go there and go up the stairs. Every time she went up the stairs, like in the moments she was in the stairs, she felt sick. Like she started feeling nauseous, lightheaded. Her legs were heavy and she felt like fainting, like something bad was going to happen. 
All of this disappeared when she got into the house. At first, she kind of handled it. She ran through the stairs and tried to ignore that feeling. I remember her coming home from work and telling my dad she felt so bad she didn't want to do it anymore. Eventually, she told that girl's mom. She explained everything she felt, and that woman was shocked because she felt so too. And she thought she was the only one. She also said she heard weird noises and lights used to go on and off by themselves. She found open doors that were closed and her dog, who was usually very calm, used to scream randomly at the walls. That woman started panicking and went to the palace keeper to ask him explanations. She felt stupid asking such things, but wanted answers. The old man told her she wasn't the only one. Basically everyone felt that, and he knew why. The palace maid, who was mentally ill, committed suicide by throwing herself down the stairs. The woman was completely shocked at that point, so she decided to move. While she was planning on moving, the dead maid's niece, who was also a maid, suicided by throwing herself from the window. Yes, she moved, and it still makes my mom feel sick. Nineteen seventy to seventy two, not far from Baltimore and before Hurricane Agnes. I was preteen at the time. All the kids and adults would gather in front of the houses where the roads came together. Most nights the adults would gather and talk. Kids played in the streets or rode bikes. Summer evening around nine PM, and I used to see planes over by Friendship Airport. Westinghouse was next to that, so sometimes experimental military planes could be seen. That evening, we noticed a very strange aircraft over that way. The light pattern and way it moved were very strange, then it just vanished. Not long after, a streak in the sky, assuming meteor, and it burst overhead. We all saw what looked like three to five foot shiny pieces of metal, like foil falling. The edges were glowing like hot metal, and they were burning up before hitting the ground. Just then, instead of looking up, I looked around me. Took me a second to realize everyone was frozen. The flakes were still falling, but people were frozen. I then noticed that one other boy was seeing me. He was a few years younger and not one of my friends, so didn't know him. That quick, everything went back to normal and everyone acted like nothing had just happened. I ran to my parents asking what had just happened. They looked at me very confused and told me to go play. Over the years, as I was the only one who seemed to remember that incident, I decided it must have been a dream and tried to forget it. Fast forward 25 plus years. I'm working near Dulles Airport in Virginia. A guy my age and two women get on the elevator with me. He's talking with, to them and mentions my old neighborhood. So I asked him if he grew up there and he said yes. Next thing he says as we're getting off the elevator, do you remember that night of the shooting star? falling metal and everything froze. A shock went through me. I said, yes, I remember that. And he said, really? You're the first person who ever said they did. After that, it bothered me quite a bit. What happened? And why did that guy comment happen all these years later? It bothered me so much. I even tried to see a hypnotist to go back to that night, but I couldn't get into the trance or whatever. So waste of time and money. Anyways, Maybe someone out there experienced this as well. If so, you're not alone. It all started when my girlfriend told me about what she saw in fifth grade. She told me that one night her and her sister were sleeping in her room and her sister woke up from a loud bang on the closet door. Her sister tried waking her up but she never budged. She didn't know what to do, but she was scared, so she left the room. The next morning, Peyton woke up, thankfully. She went about her morning as usual and went to her closet for a shirt. She was met with a white figure with black pulsating eyes. She stared into them and saw a black smoke-type substance ooze out. She screamed and ran away to her mom, but she didn't even believe her. Even when she showed the scars it gave her in her sleep, her mom just chose to believe she did it to herself. 
When she told me about this for the first time, I immediately didn't feel right about something. And the feeling has never gone away to this day, every time I'm at her house. I always feel like I'm being watched. It's even worse when I'm going through shit. It's like I can feel it feeding off my pain and energy. The same for her too. I know it is. I feel a dark intention over everybody living there. Ever since we had started getting paranoid about this shit, it feels like it's becoming more tangible as the days go by. The only time I don't feel it is when me and her are having a good time and being calm together. I feel like the only way to manage it is to turn it into something positive, but it just feels all too sinister to get rid of with good thoughts. It makes its way to us, I feel like. I'm not exaggerating. In mid-2020, around six months or so in, she started having these moments where she would just, like, not even be herself at all, and just act weird and stare at me with a blank expression. And a minute later, she would act as if nothing happened. I begged her to chill the fuck out most of the time it happened, because she would say shit like, I love you so much, Peyton, and let's do something together, and shit like that. She would have a disturbing amount of joy in her face. Well, not so much joy, but more like delusional sounding. It sounded like the tone you would use if you responded to someone saying, I'm so ready for this year, but didn't mean it at all, and just sounded like you're annoyed and angry overall. Sometimes I would just stare at her while this happened, until it stopped, and she came back. She would always play it off like nothing happened, but I just think she wants to believe that nothing really did happen. So every time I would either not say shit and act like it didn't happen, or freak the fuck out and beg her to tell me what the hell's going on. But usually, a response never got further than a worried, just stop talking, I don't want to be scared of Peyton. But all of this stopped when something weird and unexplainable happened. Me and her were sitting at her coffee table, just hanging out one day, and I was looking around for my vape. I remembered setting it behind me upon a quick search. It was nowhere in sight. I asked her if she had it with her, and she told me she didn't have it. We looked around for a minute before giving up, leaving me baffled and agitated. But when I said the words, where could it be, or something along those lines, mine and her eyes both followed something, falling from above our head. We saw it land on the table right next to a lighter, without moving an inch from the exact angle and point it fell. It didn't even bounce. It was as if it was set on the table by a machine or some shit, That's the only way I can describe it because of how unnaturally the shit felt. After we had frantically tried making explanations for what had just occurred, something else happened. I asked her how the vape could have been landed like that, and she responded with a confused, wait, what? I repeated myself and told her what had happened, confused as fuck as to why all of a sudden she was acting like this. She told me she saw the lighter fall next to the vape. To this day, I don't know how to explain this one plausibly. I don't think I'll ever be able to do that honestly. After this happened, shit had cooled down for a while. Nothing had happened to raise concern or anything. I didn't even feel its presence anymore. It might have been from us trying to ignore it, but it did go away for a few months. But once I brought my friend Zach over to the house, shit hit the fan. We were all hanging out as planned. But when he went upstairs, Zack started acting weird. He looked like he was hiding something from us, so I asked him if he was alright. Right then and there, I saw his face go pale, and he started dragging himself along the kitchen wall. His face brought the calendar to the ground, and he went with it. He hit the ground with ease, so I thought he was fucking with us at first. I helped him up while I gave him shit and made jokes like, I knew I couldn't stand you, and dumb shit like that. I asked if he was alright, and he reassured me that everything was fine, and that he just needed to eat because he was lightheaded. So I went to the fridge and got some turkey and cheese out, and turned to get the bread on the other side of the kitchen. I glanced to him, and I thought he was checking out my girl, so I sized him up right there. But it turns out he was blacking out from something. How did I find out? It looked like he let go of his body, literally. I thought he died right then and there because he dropped harder than a fucking dumbbell would hitting the ground. And the fucked up part is, before he dropped, he got one more worried sentence else. This place is fucking haunted. When I think about that day, I still hear the loud bang repeat in my head. 
Something about it just fucked me up. Now, a few months ago, me and her were in the basement in the exact spot as we were when the incident happened with the vape and the lighter. Except, I was living there at the time due to my parents kicking me out. The police had showed up and illegally kicked me out because of my stepmom telling them I wasn't supposed to be there. The fact of the matter is, I was with my girlfriend at the time, and we had blown up an air mattress for me to sleep on while I stayed there. The coffee table was moved to the wall while me and her just hung out and cuddled on the air mattress. But after a while of doing that, she wanted to have a sick. So she looked in the rest of the pack she was saving. She told me one was missing, and I looked around where I was laying so I could find it. But once I showed the least bit of a hint that I was giving up on finding it, which was literally sighing, it fell from above our fucking heads and landed next to my hand. Me and her both saw the exact same thing that time. But after it happened, we went on with our day and tried laughing it off. But it was honestly just awkward as fuck after that happened. A little while after that happened, my friend Zach came over again. When he arrived, we started making jokes about him passing out and stuff, just fucking with him for real. And overall, the whole day went as planned. But near the end of the day, me, my girlfriend, Peyton and him were all on the mattress when all of a sudden, Zach and her heard a loud crash coming from the bathroom. I didn't hear it because I had music on my phone and I was holding it relatively close to my face. So I was skeptical when Zach told me something crashed in the bathroom. But when I saw my girl kind of freaking out, I went to go check the bathroom to calm her. I also didn't need Zach passing out again just in case this was a contributing factor. And I wanted to make my girl feel safe. So I went over to the bathroom door and opened it. On the ground was her basket of bathroom stuff, laying upside down with everything still in it. Keep in mind that the basket was sitting on top of the toilet with perfect balance before. It fit the whole top lid of the toilet, around two feet or less wide. So it had to be pushed off with a lot of force to recreate that kind of thing without getting shit all over the floor. And at that moment, I realized I don't know if I should bring my friend Zach here anymore. This was the second time shit happened while he was there and things were getting tense between everyone. So we just called it a day and he went home. The most recent thing to happen actually occurred at her brother's house. This makes me think it can follow people. Because when I passed out on the bed downstairs with her and her brothers, she tried waking me up because I had to go upstairs. Her brother and his girl wouldn't let me and her ever sleep together. And I know that for a fact. I wouldn't be caught dead like that ever, I know for that for sure. Because frankly, I'm not trying to get killed. But anyways, I fell asleep in the bed a few minutes before she tried shaking me awake. And she said I didn't respond in the slightest. She had to shake me as violently as she could to get me up. And after she did so, I got up really fast. And she told me I started staring at her. She said she remembers me talking like I was emotionally dead or something. And that I was saying the weirdest shit. She claimed I would look at her with a wide-eyed expression and be like, I love you, and I'm not leaving Peyton. She said she tried shaking me even more, because after that, I just stared off into space with a mad expression pointing her way. But once she shook a response out of me, apparently I swung my arm towards her. If you know me, I take a fucking bullet before I even think about laying a hand on my girl. But after this, she yelled at me and demanded I go upstairs. Apparently, I yelled fine and walked toward the stairs menacingly. She told me I'd climb the stairs like nothing, while having no appearance of even being aware of anything at all. She's pretty sure my eyes were closed while I was going up the stairs too. I don't know what happened to me, but I think it might have something to do with the way she was acting all that time ago. But the fact of the matter is, something is in her house, and it needs to leave us the fuck alone. I took a trip with my friend to visit her family for a few days. The first night, we took her car for a test drive after helping her dad with the car around 1am. The city was built on Native American burial grounds, so most graves were dug up and dismantled, so hauntings are common here and invites more bad hosts. Anyway, as her dad was talking about his experience with stuff here, he mentioned La Lechuza, 
a witch from Mexican folklore that takes form of an owl. And as he started to talk about her, a giant owl swoops in front of us, nearly hitting the owl, and we all just shut up for a moment. Then we see another giant owl later on a sign in a residential area, and to confirm it was an owl, he pointed a flashlight at it, but refused to turn on again and again. When the owl flew away, it decided to turn on, and that's when we all agreed to go home. Later that night, I got high with my friend, and after a while, we went our separate ways. I'm in her brother's room playing Xbox, still pretty high. Her brothers leave downstairs while I'm there alone in the dark with the screen on. She's in the room next to me and texts me, Hey, are you upstairs by any chance? I say yes, why? Moments later, a black transparent figure slowly walks in front of the TV, and with the blink of an eye, it's gone. I got scared, so I left to where my friend is at. I thought, man, maybe I'm tripping. She told me she heard footsteps upstairs when her brothers were already downstairs. I wasn't walking. Later, everyone is in the room with us, having a good time, when the youngest brother comes in, running upstairs, crying and scared. He saw a black, transparent figure, face and all, try to reach out towards him, coming from the downstairs garage. Her dad had told us prior that the house has something that hasn't disturbed them like it did tonight at all. I just didn't want to believe it. We all slept in the living room together after, because three of us confirmed we saw and heard something. Crazy night. I still kept going over though. As a child and young teen, I always had this feeling that something or someone was around me. Not unlike that feeling you get when you're asleep and someone is staring at you when you wake up. Maybe that's not the best description, but the actual feeling is not dissimilar. When I was young, I lived in a cul-de-sac that housed about six families, all of which were fairly young and had children around my own age. Most of us became quite close. I became very close with one particular family, and mostly besides my best friend, the mother of that family. We talked about things that in hindsight were probably not normal at that age, but not in the sense that it was obscene or threatening, it was just scary. Scary on a level that portrayed emotion wouldn't be able to be observed. It was emotional, and yes, at first, obviously verbal, yet something I can't quite describe with words. It started with me telling her of things I had seen. Nothing disturbing per se, but something I had learned to keep to myself in my early years. I'm still hesitating to word this to this day, but I'll do my best. From a young age, I always had this strange sense that there were people around me. I felt things and remembered things that I couldn't possibly by most standards remember, and I've creeped out my parents many times by doing so. They always chalked up to maybe seeing a photo or a video, but the absolute inexplicable they just chose to laugh off and disregard, which was fine by me, and still is to some extent, but recently I've become personally affected by these memories or thoughts. I'm not sure anymore. This brings me to the present day. As someone who is dreaming vividly and thinking they're seeing the very things I thought I saw and felt as a child, coming to fruition after many years of suppressing and denial. I'm so confused. I can't help but to keep thinking back to those discussions I had with the mother of my best friends. The words I heard, the children I saw in corners huddling and crying that were not really there. The intuitions that turned into reality and the fact that she told me I had psychic abilities and she could feel my energy, which I didn't understand then and wish I didn't now. All of it freaked me the fuck out. It does freak me out. I'm not sure why after many years of dedicated and deliberate su suppression, this is all flooding back into my mind with the force of a tsunami now, but all that I can say is I wish I could stop it. It feels like I'm going insane. Am I? When I was a little girl, I lived in a little house, though it seemed massive at the time, on a large piece of horse stable property in Holly, Michigan. It was a household belief that the place was haunted. It was also a household belief that the spirit was benevolent, but that didn't stop it from giving quite the scare. Dishes fell off counters, the front door closed by itself, 
and on one occasion, a row of porcelain dolls all stacked at different levels of shelving and surfaces fell like dominoes. When we decided it was haunted, there were seven of us there. Me, my sister, my dad, his girlfriend and her three kids. But the girlfriend and kids had left and my sister was spending the night with her friends and my father and I were in two separate corners of the house. So maybe the ghost was shy. I had just turned off the lights and crawled into bed, shut my eyes when I heard someone say my name. I opened my eyes to a pale slender figure with jet black hair crawling toward me. When I recall the figure, I only see two black holes for my eyes and two black slits for nostrils. I like it too much to Michael Jackson's skin suit in Scary Movie 3. It may have had distinguishable features, but I didn't commit them to memory. It seemed calm. It seemed it may be trying to say something to me, maybe even console me. As it reached toward me, but I panicked. I screamed and my dad busted into the room instantaneously and turned on the lights. Being he was on the opposite side of the house with two hallways in a living room to get through, I assume I was screaming before I'd actually realised. The figure had vanished, and my dad and I slept in the living room that night. When I was there, I got tasked to help with housekeeping and cleaning rooms. I did a night shift in the ER, emergency room. Usually there's only one other person that actually works there to help when needed. For the first month, I didn't really realise anything out of the ordinary, except the feeling I was being watched. I didn't really think much about it because, well, I was in my military uniform cleaning rooms of people who got released or passed away. This one time, I felt that there was something more than just people watching me. When I was in a room, just me and I just had this weird type dread of being watched by something. While I was cleaning the room, it felt like there was someone there just in a corner but I couldn't see them. Toward the end, right when I was about to leave, I felt extremely cold. Not like a weird chill, like a type of a death chill. It was such a weird feeling, something I had never felt before. After I left, I just felt so scared till I relaxed. I don't understand what could have caused it or how I got so cold in a matter of seconds. This also happened in the ER while I was by myself again. How fun. So in the hospital, all the soap and hand sanitizer are all motion activated. It started out as a slow night, about two rooms an hour. After about eight hours, I was nearing the end of my shift. I had one more room to clean. As I was cleaning, I started to have the feeling I was being watched. So I just ignored the feeling. Probably not the best idea, as you'll see. After about five minutes of feeling that I was being watched, I started cleaning the bed, which was the last thing I had to do. As I was cleaning, the soap dispenser went off, even though I was the only person there. I ignored it, as I was going to clean it before I left. Not even 30 seconds later, I heard footsteps in the bathroom, and being me, I decided to look to see if anyone was in there. As soon as I poked my head in, I got so cold and got instant goosebumps. So I left the room and I started cleaning a public bathroom for the last 30 minutes of my shift. As I was cleaning the bathroom, the towel dispenser just kept spitting out paper towels after paper towels. After that, I was done with my shift and left. The first experience I remember happened during summer break after the first grade also in my childhood home. The very first occurred in my childhood home that my father built in the mid 60s, before I was born. I'm not sure exactly what year. I sold it in 2016 after my mom passed and I couldn't find the exact year it was built when I went to pull the deed. It was a three bedroom ranch in a great neighborhood. There were lots of kids my age and an awesome place to grow up. Small town in South Carolina near Myrtle Beach. My father passed that spring and my mother had a full-time job. She didn't like leaving me by myself. I have a brother that's nine years older and the couple next door were retired and they kept an eye out for me. This was the mid-70s and there was virtually no crime in this town, so it was relatively safe. On this day, my brother and mother were at work, but the neighbours were home. 
I was in my backyard playing football with my friends when nature called. I went inside our house to drop the kids off at the pool. While doing so, I clearly heard a woman's voice say my first name, followed by my first and last name. Like, Richard. Then a few seconds later, Richard Johnson. Not my name, but the same number of syllables. It was a pleasant voice with no urgency. It was melodic in tone, almost sung. It was somewhat unnatural. I'm not sure how else to explain it. It wasn't muffled, then it sounded like the woman was in the house. I remember thinking that it was weird, and the voice wasn't a familiar one. Initially, I wasn't scared as I thought it could have been the neighbour. It wasn't unusual for people to drop by. Our home had lots of drop-in visitors. I quickly finished up my business and looked around the house. It was empty. I started thinking that I didn't hear the back door open before I heard it. Normally I would have. The back door had a cheap storm door with a little hydraulic arm and spring that would creak and pop when it opened and closed. The front door was almost never opened and locked up tight. Now I'm freaking out. I went next door to ask my neighbour if she had come by. She said no and asked if someone was in our house. I told her no and it must have been the TV, trying to hide my fear and anxiety. I was positive the TV wasn't on. Also, no radios or anything else. I didn't let her know I was freaking out inside because my mother was hesitant to let me stay home by myself as it was. If I had alarmed the neighbour, I'd be sent to daycare or relative's house. I knew this and didn't want that. Mom had already threatened this if I got into trouble and I wanted to spend the summer with my friends. There are possible explanations for this, such as an auditory hallucination, some other person stopping by, etc., I never had any auditory hallucinations before or since. Another neighbour or family member would not have come in and left so quickly. I was out of the restroom in less than a minute after hearing this. There simply wasn't enough time for anyone to get back to their vehicle and leave. Our driveway was long, with a circle around the front yard. My friends in the backyard didn't see anyone else go into my house. I never said anything else about this to anyone and I just put it in the back of my mind. I just let it go and went back to playing football. This is the first time I remember and very mild compared to the others to come. I've had maybe a dozen throughout my life and I'm middle-aged. I've never actually counted them. My experiences have been years apart. As I've gotten older, I believe that I'm somewhat sensitive to the other side or however you want to define it. I don't claim to understand it. I believe in the spirit world and the possibility of interdimensional beings. Though I grew up in a Christian home, I'm not a religious person. I do not believe in organised religion. However, I do believe that there's something beyond this reality, whether it's the spirit world or anything else that we can't or don't comprehend fully. I've studied many religions, including the dark ones, as well as Wicca and Voodoo. I've done this out of curiosity mainly. I don't believe in them for the most part. This encounter happened a few years after my first experience, where I heard a woman's voice calling my name. It had been a couple of years since my father passed. My mum had started dating a man she met at church that would soon become my stepfather. It was a warm summer Sunday night and I was home alone as I didn't want to go to the evening church service. I loved Sunday night TV and was watching my favourite shows. I was hungry and went to the kitchen to get a snack. I could easily see the TV from the kitchen table as our home had an open floor plan. Everything was good and I was enjoying the shows and having my snack at the kitchen table. Then the lights dimmed and flickered. It wasn't uncommon during this area to have brownouts in this area of South Carolina. This time was different though. The atmosphere in the house became heavy, dark and evil. It got really cold and I was immediately weirded out. The lights flickered for a minute or two and then went back to normal. Okay, weird, and I felt uneasy. I remember losing focus on the TV and being hyper aware of something or someone being with me. I tried to brush it off and continue to watch TV, but I could barely focus on it. A few seconds later, I saw a shadow figure out of my peripheral moving around the entrance of the hallway, to the right, 
and a door directly in front of me that looked into the unlit dark formal room. The hallway went to the back of the house where the bedrooms were. I'm spooked out big time, but I hesitantly go to investigate this shadow figure. I look down the long hallway, formal room and bedrooms. Nothing there. There shouldn't. Couldn't have been anyone else in the house anyway. They would have had to enter through the back door located behind the den, through the mudroom and past my line of sight. It couldn't have entered through the front door in the formal room. It was an oversized, heavy, solid wood door, secured by a bolt lock and difficult to open due to the frame swelling from the humidity. This door made a lot of noise when simply unlocking the bolt and definitely when opening it. We rarely used it. So it's not possible that someone entered the house without being seen or heard. I'm very spooked and uneasy, but try to convince myself that it was just a flicker of the power and I was imagining the shadow figure. I'd lost my appetite and went back into the den leaving my food on the table and started trying to watch TV. That heavy feeling had not left the house, but I tried to ignore it hoping it would go away. A few minutes later, I saw the shadow standing to my left in the kitchen, out of the corner of my eye. As I turned to look at it, it slowly faded. I'm now frozen with fear. The lights dim again and I hear a scraping noise from outside of the house which sounds like someone dragging a rake or something metal down the brick exterior walls. I noped right out of my house immediately and ran into my neighbor's backyard. I'm scared to be inside or outside of my house at this point. I'm terrified more than I ever have in my life. I don't feel safe in the neighbor's yard either, but I'm a few hundred feet away from my house. My neighbors are not home and their house is completely dark. From where I'm standing, I can see into the den through a large picture window. The room is lit by one lamp and I can see shadows moving about. At one point, I see the shadow watching me through this window. This lasted for several seconds, it seemed like an eternity. It wasn't shaped like a person, but more like a tall dark void of empty nothing. Around three feet wide and over six feet tall. It went beyond the top of the window that was three feet tall six feet wide, and the top was six feet off the floor. This entity didn't feel friendly. It felt angry and hostile. It oddly felt familiar though. A minute later, I see headlights coming down the driveway. It's my mom and stepfather-to-be. A sense of relief came over me and that heavy feeling dissipated. Almost immediately, the shadow disappeared and everything went back to normal. My mom sees me in the neighbor's yard and is immediately pissed that I'm outside. I incoherently try to offer up some kind of explanation, but I'm rambling gibberish. My mom being short-tempered says, just get your butt inside, there's nothing in there. I hesitantly did as told. When we got inside, she was not happy about the kitchen being in a complete mess. My food was scattered all around the table and floor. I didn't do that. I usually cleaned up after myself. I had no explanation and had given up on trying to explain what happened. I knew it would sound unbelievable anyway. I have no explanation for this experience, even after decades of research into the paranormal. Perhaps it was my father's spirit, angry about the presence of another man in the house he built. Or when my friends and I found a Ouija board in a closet and asked it a couple of questions. That's another story for later. This visitor or something similar would return again soon. The scraping noise would also return a few more times over the years. It's really great to tell these events after all these years. A short time before the encounter with the shadow entity, my friends and I were playing at my house. There were about four of us, don't exactly remember. I had a lot of friends in my neighborhood within three years of age. I was very young. We were bored and decided to play Monopoly or something. We had a closet full of board games. This was the late 70s. While digging through the games, we found a Ouija board. I'm not sure where it came from. It didn't just appear or anything like that. My father built the house and Parker Brothers made them and they could be purchased at most department stores. My older brother probably bought it, I don't know. 
I'd seen one on TV, so I kind of knew how to use it. My friends and I started asking questions, and the planchette started slowly moving. They were dumb kid questions, and I really don't remember them. Except for one. Convinced that one of my friends was moving the planchette, I decided to ask something to prove whether it was real or not. Everyone swore they weren't moving it. The questions were mostly yes-no things, and it moved with purpose. I didn't have a clue what my mother's age was. Never had any reason to think about it, and didn't care. I'm sure my friends could have cared less about it too, so that's what I asked. The planchette moved again, pointing to two numbers. My friends asked me, is it right? I didn't know, and they were like, Dan, why'd you ask? I just said, I don't know. We said we were done, and the planchette moved to buy. A little freaked and bored with it, we put it away. When mum got home, I asked, mom, how old are you? She told me, and the board was correct. This was an odd experience for a couple of reasons. I was so young, I didn't know or care. I'd never had a reason to wonder or care about this. My mother had me at a late age, so she was a good decade older than my friend's mothers. I was a little freaked out about this, but I really just found it strange. In the dream, it's always me, walking along a rural path, similar to that of the farms and land on the outskirts of my city. Everything is normal, except that it's night and there is fog. There is also no one on the street. Apparently, at the end of that path, there is always a group of people whose voices, distance, are always familiar to me. In fact, I think they are my friends, and sometimes, people I know from high school are with whom I interact daily. The strange thing is, is that as much as I hurry, I never manage to reach them. That's when the fog becomes denser and I lose sight of them. That's when it starts, when I get lost for not seeing more than 10 meters in front of me, and I have to shout to call them, but nobody answers me. The air turns cold and I run to a barn that I know is empty, only with an old tractor and an electrical pole. I climb to the top of the tractor to try to see them and also to be heard better, and she appears. First, it's like something I seem to see on the ground. Then I distrust and proceed to climb on the roof of the barn. Once there, I can see that it appears, as if crawling on the floor, a very thin woman, almost skeletal, with very long and tangled hair, completely naked. Then I climb a little more, until I pass the other side of the roof, where the light pole is. And suddenly, she appears without more than the top of that same roof and looks at my face, twisting her body, like screaming. That's when I see her up close and her body is rotten, almost grey, with huge eyes of a glowing green that is not natural. He lunges at me with a sort of howl, drooling, and I duck out of the way in time for him to hit the light pole and get a little, little electrocuted. I climb down the wood and run. I wake up. This would be nothing more than a recurring nightmare, but now comes what is beginning to worry me. It's been several times that I seem to see it or it's, it's present in my day to day in some way. The other day I was having a milkshake with my colleagues until they went to pay, just for a moment. And in that couple of minutes, I thought I saw her standing across the street, looking at me ecstatic. Yesterday, returning late through the neighborhood, there were no people on the street for a few moments, and there was a strange silence. Then a strange breathing caught my attention, and I looked towards the window of one of my neighbours. At first I thought it was her mother, an old woman peeking out. But then I noticed her long hair like a shadow, and suddenly a thin grey hand slammed down hard on the glass from inside the house. There are more strange situations, but those two are the most recent. What I find surprising is that it happens when nobody can verify me if they see something, or if it's just me who has the paranoia. I mentioned it to a friend and he told me to ignore it, that it would be nonsense. But the concern came when I was in the park with two friends and when they went to buy some sweets, I just watched a girl playing on a swing far away from me. That woman appeared behind the swing in the blink of an eye and the girl fell face down and fainted how strong the blow was. Her mother and I ran to see how she was doing 
and she ended up taking her to a hospital. From that moment on, I'm kind of scared. About two or three years ago, when I was a gerontology student in Venezuela, I spent five days a week at my grandmother's house, and then returned home on weekends. The issue is that at the time, Venezuela had a critical situation in relation to pensions for the elderly, who had to get up early at about 2 or 3 a.m. in my city to stand in line at the bank. They even hoped that at some point during the day, afternoon or even evening, they would be able to receive the money and return home. I apologise for telling these details, but I consider them necessary so that you can understand where I was at the moment that this paranormal event occurred. It all began on a Tuesday at about 8pm. My grandmother told me that she would be leaving with a friend to go to the pension at about 3.30 or 4am on Wednesday. So in case I woke up and did not find her at home, I would already know where she was. Since this was not the first time this has happened, I decided to set my alarm on my cell phone to go off around 7am so that I would be up by 8am to complete my chores for the day. I spent a quiet night without any problems, but the weirdness started first thing when I woke up. But at that moment, I had no idea it was going to be a weird event. The alarm went off at 7am and I woke up completely. I'm more difficult to get out of bed than to wake up. Then the first thing I see is that the bathroom next to my room is with the light on. I noticed that because I leave a little open the door of my room because the air conditioning was very powerful. So the light of the bathroom or the hallway would be easy to observe. Then, not only was the light on, but I could hear the sound of my grandmother's makeup case being handled. At that moment, I was a little surprised, thinking that my grandmother had not gone to the bank. But I didn't give it much importance. I thought that surely she had returned for breakfast because someone was watching her place in line or something like that. Of course, I didn't dare go out to say good morning because of the same laziness of having to get out of bed. So I turned to the opposite direction of my bedroom door and started to check my cell phone. The noise continued until it stopped. I heard my grandmother touch the button to turn off the bathroom light. I heard how she closed the bathroom door and I heard how she went down the stairs. Everything went on as normal and I got out of bed at about 8.30 had breakfast, and had a quiet morning. My grandmother came home around 12.30 noon. Everything was normal, until I asked her why she had left so late, and not in the early morning as she had said. My grandmother looked at me with a confused face, and told me that she had been out of the house since 4am. Normally, one who lives a normal life and has to live experiences like these, can end up being more than scary. However, this was a little surprising for me, because I had never had an experience like this, but I did have a little history with weird experiences. Of course, after explaining this to my grandmother, she was more than surprised than me, as expected. Unfortunately, an experience of this type did not happen again. Although strange things happened, but it was not something frequent, but something that happened suddenly and already. But I must say that I never liked that house, because I feel that it has something that makes it uncomfortable for me. But that's history for another time. Oddly enough, I remember that we seemed to have gotten the same spot we had gotten the previous year. At the top of the hill, not far from the path that leads down to the lake itself, where there was a dock. When we got there, my brother was excited to get down to the lake and start fishing right away. I stayed near my parents while they set up our camper and camp. I remember seeing a walking stick insect for the first time. Being a bit afraid and amazed by this strange bug and playing with it and some other insects. Fast forward a few hours and my mother told me to head down to the lake and get my brother for dinner. I was walking down the path, almost to the lake, when suddenly I heard my brother yell, Son of a bit! Then I heard a splash. I ran down the path and found my brother in the lake, up to his knees, bending over trying to grab something in the water. Later I found out that after hours of fishing, he finally caught a fish. And just as he was pulling it up, it fell off the hook and back into the water. He was determined not to lose the fish, so he jumped in the lake to catch it with his bare hands. 
He claims that he was able to grab the fish, but it shot out of his hands like a wet bar of soap. Shoots out of your hands when you grab it. A while later, after dinner, we were all sitting around the campfire roasting hot dogs or marshmallows, having fun and talking, when something came walking out of the fire. It walked or looked exactly like a turtle, only it seemed to be made of burning coals. It looked like a glowing, red-hot burning log, but in the shape of a turtle, and it was walking. Being the small child and animal lover that I was, I jumped up to go help this poor creature. One of my parents grabbed me and held me back, knowing I would burn myself trying to save it. My whole family saw it. We were all surprised and confused about what it was and how it could still be alive. My older brother got up, walked over to the turtle that was still walking at this point. He took a stick and struck it hard right in the middle of its shell. It immediately shattered into pieces. Of course, I was devastated that my brother had just killed it. My parents held me and kept me from going over to it. In the morning, I went out to look at the shattered remains and body of the animal, and all I found were a bunch of cold coals, like burned chunks of wood from a fire. I didn't find a shell, bones, or burnt animal at all, just black coals. Like someone had taken hot coals out of the fire and placed them where my brother had killed the turtle creature slash thing. I've talked to my family about this since then. Surprisingly, only my brother seems to have a vague memory of it happening. I don't know how my parents don't remember this strange occurrence. This was not a spiritual manifestation, or hallucination, or illusion, etc. This is an actual event that happened. Has anyone ever heard or seen of such a thing before? So far, I haven't met or talked to a single person, outside my family that witnessed it, that has ever heard of or experienced anything remotely like this. Even if it was a living turtle, how could it be completely burned up and still survive long enough to walk out of the fire, the distance of at least three feet, before my brother shattered it? In 2018-2019, I was dating this guy, and I would always sleep over at his place on the weekends. I would sleep on the right side of the bed, and he would sleep on the left side. One night, I woke up because I guess I could feel something staring at me. I opened my eyes and my boyfriend was sitting on the edge of the bed, to my right, just staring at me and smiling, but the way he looked was so creepy. Nothing different about how he looked, but the only way I can explain it is evil. Like a super big smile and wide eyes just staring at me, but not saying anything. This guy would always mess with me and joke around, so I thought he was just trying to freak me out or something. I was about to ask him what he was doing, like the words were about to come out, when all of a sudden, I felt his body laying down, asleep, and heard him breathing deep to the left of me. I immediately knew this thing that was staring at me was not my boyfriend. I stopped myself from saying anything or even looking at my actual boyfriend lying next to me. I was still looking right at whatever this thing was that I had thought was my boyfriend. I had an overwhelming sense of just feeling like I was in danger, and if I said anything or looked at my boyfriend to my left, it would know that I knew it wasn't my boyfriend, and something bad would happen. All of this was going through my mind super fast, like it was maybe three seconds after I realised my boyfriend was actually asleep to my left, that I just quickly grabbed the comforter, closing my eyes and threw it over my head while turning to my life, grabbing hold of my real boyfriend. And I just stayed like that until I fell back asleep. I've had sleep paralysis before, a couple times, and I know how it feels. This was not sleep paralysis. I still remember every detail so vividly and have no explanation for it. I've always believed in the paranormal, alternate dimensions, and extraterrestrials. I just generally believe that the universe is extremely vast, and humans can't possibly mentally grasp everything out there, and anything is possible. However, I've never been very sensitive to anything like that. 
I've experienced spooky things, sure, but nothing too extreme for me to explain it away. Picture frames that have been hung for years, dropping to the floor, seemingly out of nowhere, my childhood home, hearing unexplained footsteps, etc. All things I could dismiss. I've also seen several UFOs on the same night. Let me know if you'd like to hear about that. But about a year ago, something happened that I've never been able to explain, and I can't get it out of my head. I live in central Arkansas, and was staying in a rented house with my stepsister and her boyfriend. I was 21. It was one floor, three bedrooms and two bathrooms. The living room and dining room were at the front of the house, connecting to the kitchen. Then there's a short hallway going down to all three bedroom doors, at the back of the house. It was about midnight, and my stepsister and her boyfriend both had work early in the morning, and were asleep. I was still awake, but was getting ready for bed. I also would like to note that I had not been drinking, smoking, or watching anything scary. I'd been chilling in my room watching TV, and was definitely not in a paranoid state of mind. I remember thinking my room was too warm for me to go to sleep. It was May, and Arkansas was already hot for the summer. I decided to turn my TV off, and go to turn the thermostat down a little bit. The thermostat is located in the little hallway, just a few feet from my bedroom door. When you step into the hallway from the bedrooms, you can clearly see into the living room. We had a sliding glass door where you can see into the backyard, and a motion sensor light on the back porch. We would not only lock the sliding door, but also have a pole wedged into it from the inside, so it will not open unless you move the pole. When I stepped into the hallway and made just a couple steps towards the thermostat, the motion light out was back on, and I could clearly see two people in the living room. They looked like they were facing each other on the couch, or just crouching in front of the couch. They were backlit from the outdoor light, so I couldn't clearly see faces, just their outline. At this point, my first thought was that my stepsister and her boyfriend were fooling around in the living room. It was completely dark apart from the outdoor light, no TV on or anything, and for some reason I just thought they were in there to have sex or something. Doesn't make much sense in retrospect, but that was my original thought. I immediately felt embarrassed and loudly said, oh shit guys, I'm sorry. Then the two figures who were originally facing each other darted their heads towards me. It was very quick, almost as if I startled them. Thinking I had walked in on them and scared them, I quickly turned around and returned to my room, forgetting about the thermostat. I was kind of giggling to myself, still not feeling scared, just embarrassed and I thought it was funny. I turned my light off and went to lay down in bed. As I laid there, I was expecting to hear them going back into their room or laughing or something. Some sort of reaction. But nothing came. The house was so silent now without my TV on. I laid there for about five minutes, then started to get worried. I decided to call my stepsister to confirm what just happened. I assume her phone was on silent because her room was right next to mine and I didn't hear a ring. When she didn't answer, I called her boyfriend. His phone rang and he finally answered. It was clear that I had just woken him up because of how sleepy his voice sounded. I asked him if they were in the living room and he said no, that they were both asleep. And he sounded annoyed that I was calling him at midnight, knowing he had to be up around four. Still not even thinking about ghosts, I told them that I just saw two people in the living room and I think people had broken in. He woke my sister up told her what was going on, and they both grabbed something from the room to use as a weapon. All I had was a pocket knife, but I grabbed it and we all decided to leave our rooms at the same time, and step into the hallway. He walked ahead of us, and the three of us made our way into the living room, turning on lights as we walked. There was nothing. The pole was still wedged into the sliding door from the inside. The deadbolt and lower lock on the front door were still locked, as were all of the windows still being shut and locked. Nothing appeared out of place. They assumed I was high or had been drinking or something, or maybe just saw jackets hanging on the coat hooks. This experience still shakes me up to think about. I stand by there being absolutely no way I could have mistaken a jacket or a shadow for people, because when I spoke, the two figures had both quickly turned and faced me. The upper deadbolt on the front door could only be locked from the inside. 
There was no keyhole for it on the outside and no way for someone to leave and lock it behind them. There's also no way someone could leave throughout the sliding door and replace the pole on the inside that kept it closed. I've never experienced like this before or since. I'm certain now that what I saw was otherworldly and not intruders. Nobody believes me though. I'm 23 now, but I was 17 when this story took place. My grandfather was very clearly nearing the end of his days. So he wanted to be with him before he passed away. So my family visited him in Tennessee for Thanksgiving. On the day we were leaving, I woke up feeling sick. My family lives fairly close to Los Angeles, so it was a long ride. And by the time we landed, I was feeling pretty awful. Being in an environment 30 degrees colder than what I'm used to didn't help either. On our first night there, we stayed at the house of my mom's old college friend. It was an old house that she had just bought and moved into. She was telling my mom about how old it was and why she ended up buying it and whatnot during the car ride. But I was feeling so groggy that I wasn't absorbing any of it. When we finally got there, I could see what she meant by old. It looked like a Victorian area house and had that extremely narrow hallways that those old houses tend to have. When we went inside, I felt a really oppressive energy immediately surrounding me. I have anxiety and being in a new unfamiliar place will often trigger it. So I assumed that's all it was and didn't really pay much attention to it. Instead, I decided to just go to bed, despite it only being around eight. I just felt terrible and wanted the day to be over. I slept on the couch in the living room. Initially, I had a lot of trouble getting to sleep. My head was killing me and I felt like my entire body was being weighed down, which I attributed to being sick and exhausted. I managed to fade in and out of sleep throughout the night. Later though, sometime around 5am, I woke up to see someone else there. At the foot of the couch, there was a large semicircle shaped window that perfectly framed a street lamp outside. Standing under the street lamp was a girl with long brown hair, and she looked terribly ill. She had dark circles under her eyes and looked pale as a sheet. She was barefoot and was wearing an old looking white nightgown. Not old as in old and worn, but old as in antique, if that makes sense. She was just standing out there, staring at me through the window and mouthing something to me over and over again. It was windy and leaves were blowing around, but her hair and gown didn't move at all in the breeze. In addition to that, it must have been horrendously cold outside, but she didn't seem to be reacting at all. She just kept mouthing the word to me. Of course, I couldn't hear her, and in my sleepy, sick stupor, I said, what? I can't understand you. Her voice then responded to me, although it's hard for me to describe where it came from. It felt like it was coming from the left side of my head, but behind me at the same time. Although it didn't feel like it was coming from anyone in the room with me, but rather like it was coming from inside my brain. The voice said, she's saying gossamer. It's good for fevers. She's trying to help you. I got really scared at this and I asked why. She doesn't know me. Why is she out there? Why does she want to help me? Then suddenly, as if in the blink of an eye, I could feel the dark figure of the girl who was outside just a second ago, standing next to the couch, leering over me. The light in the room was coming from behind her, so she looked like a dark shadow person. Leaning over me, she whispered, It's okay, you're going to be alright. I immediately woke up, and I felt absolutely terrible. I was extremely disoriented as well, because I remembered waking up and seeing the girl outside the window and couldn't figure out why I had just woken up again. I tried to get up and tell my mom that I needed help, but as soon as I got up, I had a hard time walking, and once I got to the door of my bedroom, my parents were in, I collapsed to the floor and poured at the door, calling for my mom. When she came out and found me on the floor, she took me into the bathroom and sat me down. Everything was starting to get very hazy, and when my mom was trying to get ibuprofen or something, I apparently passed out. 
The girl was with me again. Only this time, she was behind me, pulling me down into the deep, deep ocean. My first instinct told me that she was trying to drag me down to hell. My mum later told me that I was having a seizure at this point. When I came to it, I remember telling my mum that I felt really, really bad. She tried to help me get me up and back to the couch. But on the way over, I blacked out again and had another seizure on the floor. I vaguely remember hearing my mom yelling to my dad for help, but it's hard to piece it together. I'd never had a seizure before in my life, so it's not like this was a common thing for me either. The entire time, I felt like the girl from earlier was trying really hard to take me with her, like she wanted me to succumb to illness. When I finally got back to the couch with the help of my dad, my fever immediately broke. I started sweating like crazy, and suddenly felt loose and relaxed. As if I was at ease after the whole ordeal. I no longer felt like the girl was there with me, and honestly, I was so exhausted that I wasn't even thinking about it. My mom stayed with me until I fell back asleep, and I was fine the next morning. I was still a bit sick the rest of the time, but nothing compared to the first night. Logic tells me that it was probably a fever dream. But the fact that I immediately felt something wrong when I stepped foot in that house and that I had two seizures after the encounter with that girl leads me to believe that it was something else. I'm not sure that it was a ghost because, to be honest, it felt more like she was an angel that could tell I was sick and was trying to take me to hell with her. I don't think she was trying to help me like the voice in my head claimed she was. I think she was trying to kill me. I've never felt closer to death in my life. I've never told my parents about this experience for fear of ridicule, and I figure that I'll never be back to that house anyway, since my mom's friend has since relocated once again, so there isn't much of a point. I just hope that I never encounter whatever that girl was again. I'll start off by saying, I'm a CNA and I used to work at a shitty nursing home. I always worked a 3 to 11 p.m. shift, but this one night in the winter, there was a storm. It wasn't too bad, but no one was showing up for the next shift, the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. So before the end of my shift, people were being mandated to stay, and I was one of them. It came to the end of my shift. I did my normal rounds and was about to start some cleaning duties. When my supervisor came up to me and told me I was switching places with another CNA, which I kind of was okay with, but whatever. There I was sent to and had one other CNA. Like I said, shitty place. So I had to do my rounds again to make sure my hall was all good. When I grabbed my clipboard, I noticed a woman at the end of the hall. So I decided I'll just start at the end of the hall so I can check on this woman first. I had asked her if there was anything wrong and introduced myself. Her reply was only, couldn't sleep. So I asked her if I could do anything, but she never responded. So I just started my rounds. As I came out of the first room, I realised she wasn't there anymore. So I decided to speed up on checking people to try and find these women. About halfway down the hall, I was heading out of the room. And to my surprise, she was standing there in the doorway. I jumped back and slightly yelled from getting scared. Luckily, I didn't disturb anyone. I began asking her where she was and where she wanted to go, thinking maybe after her little walk, she'd be tired. She only answered with short answers. Yes, no, sure. I asked where her room was, 134, which wasn't on my side and she was quite a bit from the room. So I took her there and the room was weirdly cold and empty. I asked if she was cold and tucked her in and that was that. Later on, me and the other CNA were called in for the beginning of the shift's meeting. When the phone rang, it was room 134 asking for me. With that being said, I told the nurse about the lady being off and her little trip around the unit and asked why her room alone was so cold and empty. He answered with, there's no one in room 134. That woman passed away two nights ago. I laughed, saying, no way. I tucked her in and had conversations with her. Stop joking around. He showed me her documentation of her passing and then her empty room. 
I couldn't even fathom that that had actually happened. It's still a huge shock to me. So again, the nursing home wasn't very good and wasn't legal with a lot of things. By the time I became a CNA, I was 18, but I've been working there for a year already. So I was pretty young and a lot of people would just tell me, you know, this probably isn't good for you, which little was like I can do it. But anyway, I worked with a woman who didn't like me, which was because I was so new. I was used to everything by the books. And I'd say like, we can't do that or we have to do it step by step. And because she was so close with our charge nurse, he wasn't fond of me. The one day I had said something and the nurse didn't want to deal with it. And had sent me over to a unit that was short staffed. I helped out over there and after our shift change meeting, the nurse on the unit was like, oh my God, you're here today. And I explained why. She then replied with, I'd love to keep you here, but your unit is actually the short one. I'd get in trouble for keeping you. So I went back, answered the call lights, and then it was dinner. My charge nurse sent me to a room to feed a bed-bound resident. But during the meeting I wasn't there for, his diet was changed and wasn't updated on our dietary sheets. Now to keep in mind this resident has been in the hospital and isn't from my part of the unit. And because I was so new, I didn't really know wrong from right. So I fed him a few bites and was paged into another room for help. I came back and the guy was choking. Within the week, he died because of aspiration. I was so upset and blamed it on myself. Every time I went into that room, it always felt like I was being watched. There was a big mirror in the room and you could see the hallway from. And I always would see someone walk in, but no one was ever there. It happened a lot. Then I had this recurring dream of this little boy who I've never seen before and would ask, how's my brother? And would always tell me, I forgive you. Then one day I found a picture of this boy, the one in my dreams. And well, it was the man who I blamed myself for his passing. I then looked for his brother who was on a difference and made it a thing. I was just normally checking up on him. A month later, the man came to me in my dreams and told me he's happy now and thanked me for caring for his brother. That was the end of hearing from that man. After he said that though, it was like a huge weight was lifted off me. I was about 15 at the time of this and my friend 16 at the time. Used to go to this house barn after school. She would go every day to muck the stalls to work off the board for her horse to stay there. It wasn't a huge barn. Sorry for all the details, but it pertains to the story. It has probably 16 stalls, but maybe 12 horses actually boarded there. The building was like a straight line, with the front entrance pointing towards the road, and the other end pointed towards the paddocks. It was easy to know if someone pulled up, because the entrance was literally right next to the road and car headlights would shine through the whole barn. Anyways, me and my friend, I'll call him Mandy, were sitting in the tack room with the door open, waiting for my dad to pick us up. This was in the winter in New Hampshire, and it gets dark by like 3.30 or 4 during that time, so it was pretty dark out, besides some lights in the barn. We're just sitting there talking, when suddenly I hear someone yell my name. Hannah? Like a question. I didn't say anything about it for about 10 seconds when Mandy said, did someone just call your name? I knew I wasn't crazy then. I said yes, and we both peeked out the tack room door. The voice sounded exactly like my dad, but there were no headlights in the driveway, and we were the only ones there. I called my dad, and he was still 20 minutes out. I want to add earlier in the day, we were bringing a horse in from the paddocks. And this horse was like 25 years old and bomb-proof as hell. He refused to go inside, to the point he actually knocked Mandy over and ran back out. It took 10 minutes to get him in. We both have wondered for years what this has meant. It's my one and only encounter with the paranormal. And honestly, now that it's been almost 10 years...
When I was younger, I was super into all things paranormal. I used to love watching horror films, tried Ouija boards, going to haunted houses, and of course, telling ghost stories. It wasn't until I was 13 that strange things actually started happening to me personally, and that fascination shifted into a slight fear of the unexplained. Back in the day, my parents used to work in the city, so most mornings it would just be me, my sister, and I left to get ready for school alone. One morning, my sister, two years older, and I were downstairs on the main floor when we heard it. The faint yet familiar sound of my sister's music box playing in her bedroom. Instantly fearful, my sister and I somehow still managed to build up the nerve to investigate. Back to back, we began walking up the stairs. As soon as we made it to her doorway, the music came to a halt. The tiny bear atop her music box was now motionless, facing us with a seemingly innocent smile. My sister and I hadn't heard that small tune in years. Unsettled, we stood there in the doorway for a moment, or just until the phone rang and startled us out of our confusion. My sister answered, and we were both relieved to hear the sound of my mom's voice on the other line. As she began explaining what had just happened to my mom, she slowly raised her hand to the point at the wall in front of her. Did you just see that? Something, someone, just went through the wall, she said, her voice shaking. She genuinely looked terrified. Now, just to clarify, I've always been fascinated by the supernatural, but doubted that my sister was able to actually see a ghost. As fascinated as I was by the idea, I don't think it would happen like that, 8am in the daylight. I didn't think it did happen. So as I was convinced my sister was just playing a prank on me, I begged her to stop so we could just leave for school. Insisting that she saw something and unwavering from that fact, she convinced me to follow her into the adjacent room to hers, to see if there was actually something there or not. In the next room was a spare bedroom with a closet on the side opposite my sister's room. I huffed and walked toward the closet, yanking the door open as I started to lose my patience for the whole thing. As I opened the doors, however, they began to slowly inch closed immediately after my release of the handles. Confused, I closed the closet and surely enough, it would slowly reopen. Whatever I did, the closet would react in reverse. I'd open it, it'd close and vice versa. My skin crawled and my sister and I ran out of the house. This particular instance was several years ago, back when I used to have a math tutor in high school. Once a week, every Friday after school, I'd have a tutoring session at the library by my house. It started at 3.30 and class would let out around 3, so I was often early. Before my session one afternoon, I went to the washroom and noticed a woman go into the last stall. When I exited my stall to wash my hands, I noticed the last stall was vacant but I also hadn't heard the woman leave. Thinking I was losing my mind, I shook it off and left to meet my tutor. After my session, it was about an hour later and I was walking home, when I started to sense that I wasn't alone. It felt as though someone was walking about five paces behind me, but I never felt the need to check. Subconsciously, I think I knew it wasn't really someone there. I made it home and, because I'm a weirdo, stood behind my brother in the garage as he was working at our workbench, trying to freak him out. After not getting the reaction I wanted, my brother several years older would take a bit to actually scare him. I entered my house. Upon entering, I started noticing a woman standing in the back corner of each room I entered, or passed by. She would just be standing there, motionless and expressionless. For whatever reason, I wasn't actually afraid at the time, rather curious. I went back downstairs to explain this all to my brother, so he could tell me I was just seeing things. I began explaining this person I kept seeing, and as I began describing her, my brother started to nod, and started asking questions about what she looked like. I instantly got goosebumps over my whole body, and a chill went down my spine as he, in great detail, described the same 
exact woman I had seen all afternoon. I stood there speechless as my brother's face fell and he asked, why do you think I didn't turn around in the garage earlier? I thought it was her. Not that I've ever mentioned it to my brother since, but I'm almost certain neither of us saw her again. I've always experienced sleep paralysis since age 12. I'm 22 now. It would happen maybe two or three times a month from ages 12 to 16. I would feel the typical, what I thought to be, witch on my chest trying to get inside my body. The typical someone climbing into bed with me and wrapping their arms around me and squeezing me until I could hardly breathe. Someone pulling at my legs. I've never experienced anything where I have ever seen someone before until two nights ago. It was typical. I woke up. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I looked around my room and saw nothing. I heard horrifying whispers, however, telling me how every single one of my family members was going to die and how the world was going to end and I wouldn't be spared because I have a wretched soul. My bed was against the wall on the right side of the room and behind it was part of the window leading to the side of my house. The whispers were coming from outside. Once the sleep paralysis was over, I quickly got on my knees and looked outside my window. I saw a woman squatting down near my window with piercing black eyes, short black hair that was all matted, very pale skin, but I could see that her veins were black. She had cuts and bruises all over her legs and her arms were bent inward. I don't know how else to explain it besides her elbows were outward of her body. She was carving something into the side of my house with her bloodied fingers. When I made eye contact with her, I passed out and hit my head. I want to believe that this was just a dream and my mind was playing tricks on me, but I've never been terrified since that day. The one thing that always gets me though is I have been terrified of my window for as long as I could remember and I barely just recently moved my bed close to my window because I always thought I was being irrational. I checked outside once I woke up and there was nothing besides a dried brown stain on my wall. It could have been dirt, and I'm too scared to think otherwise. The year was 2011, and it was my 21st birthday. I don't remember much from earlier in the day. All I can remember is my boyfriend at the time and myself went to my parents' house to see them and spend time with them for my birthday. During my visit with my parents, I noticed that my mother seemed really off. The facial expression she carried seemed far away, like her mind was elsewhere, but her body was there. I do need to point out that my mother and I were extremely close. She was literally my rock, the most important person to me in my life. I remember being there for a few hours. We had cake and ice cream and took a few pictures. I didn't know it then, but eventually I'd come to the realization that that would be the last picture I would ever get to take with her. I remember getting ready to leave and kissing her and hugging her goodbye. The last word she ever spoke to me was, I love you and I'll see you tomorrow. But sadly, before tomorrow came, she passed away in the middle of the night due to a brain aneurysm. I would later discover, a year or so later, that she was aware that she was terminally ill and fought her battle in, mostly, silence and alone only choosing to tell her mother, who was also passed in recent years since. Fast forward about three months after she passed. Up until this point, I've had a few bizarre and otherworldly experiences, but this one takes the cake. My partner and my roommates all worked at the same place, so they worked the same hours and I was the odd ball out. I worked the second shift for a local restaurant and wasn't expected to be at work until 4pm on this particular day. I'm asleep in bed, and when I'm awoken up by the alarm clock, the time is around 2pm. I wake up and roll over to hit the snooze button, and turn back over to fall back asleep. When I turn over and close my eyes to drift back to sleep, I'm startled by the feeling of someone's hand nudging me softly on my arm, through my blankets. Naturally, I was instantly terrified. I knew I was home alone, and what was happening to me right then should not be happening. It wasn't logical. 
I remember feeling the heat from fear rise in my cheeks. I couldn't move. I thought that if I just laid there and ignored it, it would go away. But, oh, how wrong I was. It just kept nudging me. So I gathered the strength and willpower to sit up in my bed and see what it was. But when I did, nothing was there. I don't know what possessed me to look, but my eyes shot directly to the mirror in the bathroom. My partner and I stayed in the master bedroom of the house, which means we also have a bathroom attached to our bedroom. The way my room was set up, you could easily see into the bathroom. As my eyes locked onto the bathroom mirror, I could see perfectly a dark shadow figure, slowly, what looked like levitating, made its way across my mirror. As if it knew the only way I could see it was by looking through the mirror. When I saw it, it's as if all time stopped. I couldn't believe what was happening to me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And most of all, I couldn't believe I was deliberately being made contact with something I didn't understand at all. Whoever, or whatever this was, wanted my attention, and it wanted me to know it was there. When I drive home from work, I come into the island from Brooklyn, to the east, and then head north on the FDR drive. I get off at 61st Street, and then head north on 1st Avenue up to 66th. I turn west onto 66th, and then I turn left again to head south on 2nd Avenue. Keep that in mind. Now my car has parking sensors, like many cars, but they're split in half, so there's a parking sensor for the front right, a sensor for the front left, and the same goes for the rear bumper. Now the sensor responds with orange bars based on proximity. The closer you get to an object, the more orange bars light up until you're within an inch or two. Then the sensor lights up red. Now, when pedestrians walk in between cars during traffic, they tend to get very close to the bumpers because the cars themselves are already very close together. And pedestrians produce a unique signature with the parking sensors. They immediately jump to red, no orange bars light up. And then the sensor shuts off just as quickly as the person passes by. So with all that in mind, this is what's happening at 66 and second. When I get home, traffic tends to be busy and sometimes the light will completely cycle before I've had a chance to even make my left turn. And I end up with my bumper in the crosswalk, but not close enough to a car to make the sensor go off. Sometimes though, the sensor jumps to red and then off as if a pedestrian has just passed by. Now you might be inclined to think it's some environmental factor triggering the sensor. And that was my first thought too, until I realized that it was only, and I mean only ever happened, at 66 and second, and only when my car is in the crosswalk. Well okay, maybe there's some sort of radar device around that's messing with it, but no. It only happens in the crosswalk, not just outside the crosswalk, only in the crosswalk. Like a pedestrian is walking by, but there's nobody there. There's probably some sort of reasonable explanation, but it got me thinking. 66 and second is a pretty busy intersection, and I'm sure in its history, a pedestrian or two has been hit. Is it totally unreasonable to think that crosswalk might be haunted? Food for thought. This story happened about a year and a half ago. I've only ever shared this story with one other person. The other person who's actually in this story. First, a little about me. I have a formal education in the hard sciences and I'm halfway through a doctor of medicine degree program. So those are the lenses through which I see the world. This makes me a natural skeptic on most things. I firmly believe in the existence of extraterrestrial life because the vastness of the universe makes it a mathematical certainty, but I'm far less convinced on the subject of UFOs, although there are a number of well-documented events that keep me from dismissing them outright. This story has nothing to do with aliens though, at least I don't think it does. I guess I only mention it for the purposes of demonstrating that I keep an open mind on things, but that I still need to see at least some sort of suggestive evidence. I'm a huge fan of the paranormal as a genre. I find the stories and media fun and entertaining. 
I like being scared. And I enjoy the experience and reflecting on what if. But it's always been just that to me. A genre of entertainment. Then this happened. And I still can't explain it. My fiancé and I grew up and live in a small city in New England. Honestly, it's really only a city by definition. It's bigger than your average New England town, but it's far more suburban than your average city. The house my family has lived in since I was two is located on the outskirts of this city. I'm now almost 30, and although my fiancé and I live in an apartment below her mom's place, I still keep a lot of my stuff there at my old house, including my motorcycle. When you pull out of the driveway and go one way, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get into the city proper. But if you go the other way, it takes about two minutes to hit farmland. Heading towards the farms, you end up on a road called Pine Hill Road. On this road is a very old cemetery with gravestones that date as far back as the 1700s. The cemetery encompasses a square plot of land bordered on three sides by trees and by Pine Hill Road on the fourth. The official name of this cemetery is Pine Hill Cemetery but everybody in the area calls it by its other name, Blood Cemetery. It's allegedly one of the most haunted cemeteries in New England. The name derives from the Blood family burial plot located more or less in the centre of the grounds, and it's where most of the alleged activity rises from. Tangibly, the Blood headstone is engraved with the image of a hand, and it's said that during the day, this hand points upwards towards the heavens while at night it points down towards the ground. It's also said that the ghost of Abel Blood roams the grounds. It's illegal to enter a cemetery at night here, and the police do patrol this area because of how frequently people try to go in at night to see for themselves. I personally have never actually been inside the grounds, day or night, not even during the experience I'm about to describe. By the way, I've used the real name of the place, Feel free to google this cemetery all you want. That way you'll know I'm talking about a real place with real stories attached to it. This really happened to me. I've driven past this cemetery a million times before, day and night, and not once have I ever seen or experienced anything out of the ordinary. That is, not until one night last fall. It must have been around late August or early September 2017. When summer was on its way out, and fall was just starting to let everyone know it was on its way. It was late and dark one night, when my fiancé and I were out for a ride on my motorcycle. We love riding around this area, because there's little traffic. The roads are just windy enough to make it fun, and the farms are beautiful. We were riding up Pine Hill Road, and were just beginning to pass blood on the left, as we've done so many times before. Going about 30 miles per hour, it must only take 3 to 5 seconds to pass the whole property. But this time, something very strange happened to me. Time appeared to slow down, when something red reflected across the visor of my helmet. I turned my head to the left, and this is what I saw. Up in a tree, just along the left border of the cemetery, there was a floating orb of the brightest red light I've ever seen. So bright, it was that its centre was white. Orb isn't really the right way to describe it though, because it wasn't just a sphere of red light, it looked like it was oozing and dripping, like it was made of plasma. The best way I can think to describe it is that it looked like the tip of a signal flare when it's held off the ground. It was that bright, and it was oozing like the tip of a flare, but it was not shooting out from anywhere like a flare does. When a flare has a sort of elongated shape from the sparks shooting out of the end, this was circular. And unlike a flare, there was no visibly physical object from which this drippy burning orb emanated from. It just was. It was bright and it was oozing, and it was dripping and it was floating up in a tree. I really can't underscore enough just how bright this thing was. To me. Then I noticed the rest. Moving around this red orb was a set of hands. I didn't notice them at first because of how bright the orb was and how dark the world was. 
But as my eyes began to focus somewhat, I realized that there was something else in the tree with the orb. And it looked like it was actually conjuring the orb. The thing was humanoid looking, but it didn't look human at all. It looked like a scrawny and lanky E.T. sort of thing, with nubby joints, fingers and features, but with scrawny limbs. Its face was long, narrow at the top and bottom, but wide in the middle. It was bumpy. It was a face unlike any human face I've ever seen before, and I've seen a lot of deformed faces. Lepromatous faces, hyperplastic faces, coarse faces, faces without calvaria. Hell, I've even seen real cyclops. Yes, cyclops really do exist, and it's actually quite a sad thing, because cyclopia results from a condition that prevents the brain from dividing, and the baby is usually stillborn. This thing's face looked like it was from hell. Its skin looked dark brown, and it appeared to be wearing some sort of baggy-looking cloak. Its legs were crossed, its hands circling around this extremely bright, oozing red orb, and it was hovering a few inches over a branch in this tree. Passing the cemetery on my motorcycle that night felt like the longest three to five seconds of my life. As we came to the other end of the cemetery, time appeared to resume itself as normal. I looked back over my shoulder, and it was gone. I looked back again, still gone. Twice more I looked back, twice more it was nowhere to be seen. I immediately pulled over, and my fiancé asked me what was wrong, because she knows I never pull my bike over to the side of the road unless something is up and I have to. Especially when it's dark, and especially not on these windy roads, where people tend to drive like a bat out of hell. I can't blame them, these roads are fun. Do you see that back there? I asked her. See what? She asked. That red light we passed back at the cemetery just now. Red light? She asked, a little confused. Turns out she hadn't seen a damn thing. Nothing. I explained to her what I had just seen or experienced or whatever it was that just happened. She believed me, noting how I looked visibly disturbed by something, but whatever that was something was, she hadn't seen any of it. It was dark and we were moving, so normally I wouldn't have been so surprised by her not seeing something like a figure up in a tree we'd passed but that orb of light. It was just so damn bright. There were no cars around, no houses from which a porch light could have been peering through those particular trees. There were no lights in the sky, no planes or helicopters around, and no explanation as to why only I saw this. I've never been diagnosed with mental illness, I don't have a substance abuse problem, and I certainly wouldn't have myself and the mother of my future children together on a bloody motorcycle if I was high or drunk. I've never had a seizure or been told that I had a seizure. I've never had hallucinations, and I've never experienced anything like this before, or anything like it again since. I've driven past blood numerous times since then too, and every time it's just been its normal, old Sleepy self. I used to be a transporter. When I say transporter, I mean a transporter of the recently deceased. How this job would work is, we would receive a text of location and name of the deceased. We would then go and pick up the freshly passed from their house, accident sites, old folks home, etc. When we arrived at the location of the deceased, we would have to pack them up. That means handling them. A thing to keep in mind is bodies make noises, grunts, groans. They're still warm and stiff. We would then have to bag them and move them onto a stretcher and then strap them down. Once they've been placed in the van, your partner would leave and you would drive the deceased to the funeral home. Here's the catch. Even if my partner was not in the van with me, I never felt alone. Once my door was shut, I would start getting a sharp itch and pressure just behind my ears. It never failed. Body after body, this feeling was always there. When asked how it feels to see the deceased, I would always reply with the same answer. It's never bothered me. To me, the soul has left, and it's just an empty vessel. I guess, though, the soul may have left the vessel, but they seem to still be hanging around for a while. Upon arrival at the funeral home, 
the deceased would be offloaded and brought into their prep room. If one spirit was noticeable, walking into the prep room was very noticeable. I remember one funeral home had a camera system that I hope just had a malfunction. One of the cameras would static and flash, then turn back on, only to cut out just when you looked at it. The other one, you would have to walk through the whole building just to turn the lights on. The prep room behind you all the way. This building always had a habit of having the doors behind you open after you went through them. Doing this job was, well, interesting. I'm not sure how to really express how overbearing the atmosphere was of the funeral homes where at two o'clock. But if you went to a creepy time, go hang out in a prep room during the witching hour. I no longer work as a transporter. I swapped out to work as an on-call pallbearer. Seems I cannot escape the dead. So I have always had bizarre experiences and dreams since I was a kid. And even now, though fortunately they have calmed down. Due to how long it has been for some of these, time will have marred my memory. I'll try to keep this as accurate as possible and sort my stories by houses. A side note, my parents separated when I was around two or something. So the stories for when I was visiting my mom will be separated per house as well. I've lived in lots of different places in my city and until recently, I've had something happen in each of my houses and apartments from apparitions to just terrible sleep paralysis. So let's start with my first house. I grew up in a small home with my dad and brother. Things were not easy and day to day always presented a new challenge from not being able to afford food to a rather, mm, let's say troubled childhood. Anyway, I only remember a few experiences from the first house. One of the biggest ones that stuck with me was during an early morning breakfast. My brother and I were sitting at the table. The table was situated close to the door that ran to the basement. I remember hearing our cat running up the stairs and when I looked over, I saw our fuzzy friend beeline it around the corner like a bat out of hell. It was odd for that cat to act like that. He was old and was not that active anymore. Looking up from where the cat turned the corner, I saw a humanoid figure with horns and a hound by his side. Chucking it up to my child brain, put whatever it was into the form. The entity was just there now watching my brother and I eating breakfast. We just stared at each other for what seemed like forever until I was finally able to look away, scared, and get my brother's attention. When we looked back, it was gone. I never felt safe in the basement. There was always something off about it, but what kid likes the basement? I'm pretty sure that's just normal. Following that event, I remember two more odd things that happened in the house. They're the same event that happened at different times. I remember waking up at night. As a kid, I was unsure of what the exact time was. Laying in bed, I opened my eyes to white mist or fog. It wasn't wet, it was just there. You could see through it fine as well as see everything in the house, almost as if you had your lights on. I opened my door and left my room to look down the hall and it was the same. A white mist that allowed you to see as if it was day. I would write it off as nothing, but it happened again to me in the same house. The mist had the same characteristics visible that it was there but never blocked your vision. It only allowed you to see as if the sun was out. Eventually we moved out of that house and into a different neighborhood with my dad's girlfriend. Unfortunately, Things only picked up for me. When I was about eight, I was sleeping in my room. It was about 3 a.m. when I slowly woke up to a voice saying calmly, but with a sense of urgency, wake up, get out of here, get out. You're not safe, get out. I couldn't even tell if it was a male or female voice. It was so neutral. I got up from my bed, nothing in my room. Got out of the bedroom, turned the hallway light on and again, nothing. Then this huge sense of urgency fell upon me out of nowhere and I ran to my parents' room. I entered as quietly as I could so I wouldn't wake them up and they didn't. 
So I closed the door behind me and went around their bed, in a way that their bed was positioned between me and the door. Then the same voice that woke me up kept saying, you're still not safe. Stay here. Don't move. Stay here. It's not safe. I stood there, crouching behind my parents' bed for a few minutes. Then I looked over the bed towards the door. In the faint light coming through the small gap beneath the door of the light I left turned on in the hallway, I see a pair of shadows moving, like feet, as if someone was moving back and forth in front of the bedroom door. The shadow kept moving for a few seconds, then suddenly stopped, as if the person behind the door stopped moving and was staring at the door, a few centimeters away from it. It just stood there, motionless in front of the door for a few minutes, then just walking away. I saw the shadow moving away and disappeared. The voice then kept saying, okay, it's better now, but you're still not safe. Stay here, it's still not safe. After about 15 minutes with no shadow, no voice, no movement, no nothing, the voice came back and calmly said, it's safe now, you can go back to bed. And so I did. Just got up, walked to my room, feeling perfectly safe and calm, and fell asleep as if nothing happened. I had just come from working the night shift at a long-term care facility for the elderly. I lived alone in my apartment on the second floor and my door was bolt locked. It was 6.30 a.m. and I finally laid down to sleep. I had my bedroom window open and could hear the cars driving on the highway. All of a sudden, I hear my name being whispered and I kind of figured it was a mixture of exhaustion and me warping the car sounds. I continued trying to sleep when I heard my name in a very clear, louder whisper. I froze. Then I heard the breathing. You know how when shivers went down your spine? I got shivers that shot through me from my feet to my skull and a feeling of pure dread. I was instantly sweating. I turned over in my bed and slowly covered the blankets over my head. And the footsteps proceeded around my bed towards me. I could hear the breathing getting closer. I was so scared. I just shut down and eventually fell asleep. The next day, I went about my day. When I finally came home, I pulled into the parking lot up to the building, parked and looked up at my apartment. I got that dread feeling in my stomach. I had completely forgotten what happened that whole day until when I got home. I thought it must have been so traumatizing that my brain shut it out. But here I was, remembering, and went over to my neighbours to tell her what had happened. I went home later after I felt brave enough and tried talking to it. I said I don't want any problems, I just want peace. I realised whatever this thing was, it had to have been around for a while to learn my name. I never saw or heard anything in that apartment again. It sounds insane, I know. This isn't the first time I've witnessed breathing and footsteps. The other time, I actually saw a figure and it scares the shit out of me thinking about what I've experienced. To recap quickly, I saw something looking like my boyfriend two times, neither of which it really were him. One time he came home physically opening doors but didn't react to me saying hi. So I followed him into a room. When I entered, no one was there. It turns out he was still in school at the time. Second time I saw my boyfriend get up out of bed and into the bathroom, but my real boyfriend was still in bed next to me. My grandma also claimed to see me open and close the living room door repeatedly. But at the time, I was somewhere else with my boyfriend. Today, I saw myself going through the kitchen, turning around and looking at something, and then going into the living room. Obviously, I was kind of freaked out by this, but I went after it, because I really want to figure out what's going on. I trust my gut feeling on these things. I didn't feel threatened or in danger, so I followed the thing, but I kind of bumped into the kitchen table with my hip 
and something small fell off. It obviously made a small sound, and since I was already on edge, I turned around, but saw that it was only one of Grandma's spools of thread that had rolled off of the table. So I turned back around and went into the living room, and no one was there again. Now I guess if I was smart, I would have figured it out then and there, but I kind of didn't piece it together. Until I told my boyfriend what I kind of just told you. Well, he said, sounds like I basically retraced the exact steps of this doppelganger. I went toward the living room, then turned around because of the noise, before turning back around and going into the living room. And now that I look at it from this angle, all actions these things have been doing are normal things. Like coming home, going to the bathroom, opening doors and stuff. I even kind of remember that I was banging doors when I was younger to annoy my grandma, which describes what she claimed to see perfectly. Do you guys think it might be possible that there is some sort of time distortion going on, for lack of a better term? Like either we see some sort of recording from what happened already, or of something that is yet to happen, like with my encounter today. The weirdest thing while doing it, I didn't even realize I was basically doing the exact same thing my doppelganger was doing, until it was brought up to me. I'm 22 years old and have a history with mental illness, PTSD and depression, but no illness that is commonly associated with hallucinations or the like. I lived together with my boyfriend and grandparents in my childhood home, and ever since I was little, some weird things would happen. Most commonly, we would see someone or something inside the house, even though all of us were in the garden, but I rarely, if ever, encountered anything face to face. When I was 16, my mother passed away, and I inherited a jewellery box. I believe something pretty bad was attached to it, and I had a very horrible experience back then, but I've put the jewellery box away since, and haven't seen that thing again ever since. To retell that story here would be way too long, so I just quickly mentioned it. I only mentioned all this so everyone has a good idea of my personal background. Maybe that helps in figuring out what's going on now. The situation at hand is that something seems to be impersonating family members. It started a few weeks ago when I was home earlier than anyone else, and I was waiting for my boyfriend to come home too. I was on my PC when I heard the door handle being pushed down. It is a bit squeaky. And the door was opened and I heard heavy footsteps behind me going into the bedroom. It sounded perfectly identical to my boyfriend's footsteps. I called out to say hi, and at first didn't think anything of it, because he often rushes past me into the bedroom, because he needs a bit of time for himself when coming home. But I didn't get any reply, and that was weird to me. So I went into the bedroom, but there was no one there. I suddenly got this really bad gut feeling, and quickly left the bedroom, and locked the door. I also closed the other door that had been opened. Later on, I told my boyfriend about it, and he thought it was creepy too. The next day, my grandma called me upstairs because she was angry that I was up late last night and slamming doors upstairs. I asked her when I supposedly did that, and during the time frame she said she saw me slamming doors while I was with my boyfriend. But grandma was adamant that she saw me clear as day. Now yesterday night, I woke up in the middle of the night and saw my boyfriend get up and walk to the bathroom open the door and go inside, but he didn't turn on the lights. That's weird because he doesn't really like the dark. Then I heard him shuffling in bed right next to me. I panicked and turned on the lights, which woke him and he was pissed. He asked me why the bathroom door was open and why I woke him up. I told him what happened and we went into the bathroom to check out if there was an intruder, but there was no one there. I'm really scared and don't know what to do. We still live under my grandparents' roof, and they won't allow us to call a priest or anything of the sorts. I'm by no means a paranormal expert, but I got really, really bad feelings from those imposter things, and I like to live that my gut's feeling is usually very accurate. Does anyone have any idea what to do? Or what is this? So 
So my dad died earlier this year, unfortunately. And the way he died was terrible, in which my whole family has to go to therapy. Yet I still miss him and love him always. To get into the experience, I've moved around a lot this year due to personal problems since my dad's passing. I also got two puppies this year from the same litter. Lost my dad and dog on the same day. Kind of like a replacement for the two loved ones I've lost this year. One of the dogs was quiet and usually chill. Except he's had moments where he starts staring at a wall or something in the room randomly when he wouldn't normally do this. I know dogs have a sixth sense about paranormal stuff as well as cats and other animals. This behaviour would happen about each month, around two to three times since I got him in May. Then I moved again to my godfather's house in which he is my dad's older brother. There still is some tense feeling here and there because it's still a very sensitive topic for my godparents and dad's side of the family to talk about my dad or even see videos of him. They were all close. Around the same time I started my new job where it would require me waking me up at 2, 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning to leave for work. In front of my room, there is a tiny light that's usually on sometimes when people forget to turn it off. There's nothing in the way of that light that could ever cause a shadow. One day, I was leaving for work about a week ago. I went to get my shoes and I'm about to leave the front door when I looked up and in front of the light was a big shadow of a person. I immediately recognised who it was. It was my dad. The only reason I know him is because of his shoulders and height. I looked and saw his big shoulders and head. I blinked, then it went away. I closed the door to the house and went to my car. Until about 10 minutes later, it hit me again that I just saw my dad. I think I cried about it after work, but I couldn't tell anyone in fear of them thinking I'm crazy. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming like I was being murdered. At one point I got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house playing with a toy on the floor while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, hey, at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall shadowy figure where my grandma was moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway. I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it was nothing to do with the nightmares at all. I really don't know. Normally, I would be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience. If my mom hadn't seen the same thing I had. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked towards her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall, shadowy figure at the end of the hall, in front of my bedroom. At first, she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her. But the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light, and the vicar vanished. She told me about this years later, 
and my dad backs up the claim since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of the apartment and I never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. In 1999, I moved back to Washington state from traveling around the country for four years. My grandmother let me move in with her for a while so I could get back on my feet again. I hated the basement of her house, always have. But it was free rent and she was cool with Chuck, my 90 pound black lab. Plus, my grandma and I got along pretty well. Late one night, about three months in, I woke up because Chuck was moving around on the bed and he kept shaking the mattress. Then I heard him start grumping. You know those grumpy groans old dogs make when you scratch behind their ears and they love it? He started doing that. Once I realized what I was hearing, I sat up to yell at him to go back to sleep. That's when I discovered the reason he was moving around so much. He was trying to get closer to the woman standing right next to my bed, scratching him behind the ear. I didn't scream and I'm proud of that. But also, what the actual fuck? Where did she come from? Who was she? Why the hell was she standing in my room petting my dog at 3am? I was too scared to ask. I did the only thing I knew how to in these situations. I hid under the blanket. Certainly, she would have gone by the time I re-emerged from under the blanket. That's how these things are supposed to work, right? I waited for a little while but when I came out from under the bed, she was still there. So I hid under the blankets again, three more times. Every time I came back out, she'd still be there, smiling at me and scratching my dog's ears. The last time I was under the covers, I realized that I wasn't actually afraid of this woman. Chuck and I met some under stressful situations for both of us. And because of that, he and I had a super strong bond. I trusted him implicitly. If she'd meant me harm, he would have reacted to her negatively. His reaction was clearly positive, so I figured that she probably wasn't there to kill me. So I came out from under the blanket last time, intending to deal with this freaky woman still standing next to me in my bed. Somehow, I decided that turning on the lights would make her disappear. I reached over and snapped the bedside lamp on. I don't know why I thought that would work. Is that even a thing? Are ghosts supposed to disappear in the light? Well, I turned on the light and she didn't. So I didn't think that was a thing. By then, she'd been standing at my bedside, putting Chuck for several minutes. And I was out of ghost busting options. So I gave up on both being terrified and just looked at her. Really looked at her. I can still see her right now in my mind, dressed up in a classy brown pantsuit with a cream coloured blouse. She had shoulder length auburn hair styled beautifully with these big loopy curls. She looked like she'd been on her way to give a work party and she only stopped by for a second to say hello. She was very pretty. She looked happy. I didn't have the nerve to talk to her, or at least I don't remember speaking. But I stayed present and we looked at each other for a while. I remember having the distinct impression of her knowing I was there, of both of us being aware of the other. Then she stopped petting Chuck and walked to the end of my bed, stood up straight and proud and dissolved away. I meant that very literally. First her clothes, then her skin, organs and bones, like that Nazi at the end of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I remember what her blood looked like as it dissolved away to reveal her skeleton. That should have been a gross and terrifying memory, but I don't remember it like that. At the time, it felt like she was doing it on purpose, like she'd wanted us to leave with the most dramatic exit she could manage. I remember thinking, this should scare the pants off of me, but also, wow. Somehow, I got back to sleep. In the morning, over coffee, I was able to tell my grandmother about what had just happened. 
but she didn't just receive an upsetting phone call. Apparently, her best friend from high school, Ursula, had passed away in the middle of the night. I'd heard stories about the teenage shenanigans, especially the one about the stolen birthday cake, but I never saw a picture of Ursula, so I asked what she looked like. I couldn't tell you what she looked like these days, but when we were young, she had the most beautiful curly auburn hair. That's not the only weird thing that happened in my grandmother's house, but it remains the most vivid and least scary. I want to start off by saying that I'm a student in the UK, learning to be a radiographer, and I do my placements at a massive major trauma center. As you can guess, we deal with a lot of major trauma events where people come in, but don't leave alive. Funnily enough, being in that environment turns a lot of people into philosophical types. On this particular day, we had to imagine a major trauma victim who'd been flung from their car windshield at 100 miles an hour after colliding head on with a lorry. They were taken to the imaging departments I was in for emergency imaging. Later, we found out they died in resus while they were trying to get better before they were taken down to the morgue. At this stage, I want to mention that the layout of the hospital means that the x-ray department was built straight above the morgue due to the practicalities of the forensic radiography service we provide. So the place where we store the dead is really close by. So later on, me and another student are cleaning the imaging room after the department's outpatients closes. I want to add that I'm certain, belief, and us English, well, we're in English. We have an affinity for this sort of thing. What with all our plagues and history and we tend to, you know, start conversations about death and ghosts. We start talking about the chap that came in earlier. I remember I talked to him while they lifted him onto the scanners because though he was drugged up and high on so many painkillers, you don't know what's going on. Maybe he could hear me. You never know, but you don't want to leave them in the dark. We said to each other, well, we hope the death wasn't so traumatic that the soul isn't stuck here and that it finds a way home and that they didn't suffer too long with their injuries and that they were at peace. Right after we said that, the x-ray machine began moving on its own. This is one of those newfangled machines that arranges itself for whatever images you want to take. You press a single button to get it to get into place. The machine was on standby and you had to click on the patient and wait projection you wanted. The machine won't move until you've selected a patient and their projection, because obviously that's the point in getting its position if you don't know what patient you have. We heard no footsteps, which you would because it's a laminated floor, and we hear hard patent canvas shoes. And you would have heard the door open because giant lead lined rectangles on hinges. None of us were near the machine buttons, which were behind a screen. I should mention that I know it wasn't a technical fault because the machine had been serviced a couple of days prior and they would have picked up the fault and put it out of service because of radiation safety issue. It moved itself into the position for a chest x-ray which was one of the positions we took for this patient, both for the CT and the mobile that we had in the resus bed for tubes and things. Maybe that's connected, maybe it isn't. But after we saw a shadow out of the corner of our eyes, both our heads went to the same corner of the room and we saw this flicker of black go out through the closed double door. We stood there speechless for a couple of minutes, trying to get our heads around what happened. We're still trying to understand what happened to this day. It's a weird thing to happen, even so that those things happened right as we said it and how things panned out. That machine has never moved on its own since that day. I personally believe that our body is a biological machine and that the energy formed from forming neurons and memories, which are networks of energy anyway, are just conscious energies which exist after the body dies. I think maybe he followed someone back and found us and he wanted to let us know he was okay before he departed to wherever he was heading to. I hope he found where he was meant to go in the end.
This happened to my sisters and I back in the summer of 1994. We were in search of an apartment to rent and one of my sister's friends recommended a townhouse she was getting ready to rent. The lady who I'll call Sylvia told my sister we should come look at the place. When we got there, we made small talk and she proceeded to walk us up to the townhouse. To give you a visual of the place, this was your typical townhouse rentals with other identical townhouses next door to each other and with a courtyard full of plants and flowers. This place also had a communal pool, if that's a thing. Anyway, the place was nice enough, clean and quiet. We walked up to the place and Sylvia told us, okay, well, the place will need a fresh paint job, new carpets, but it will be ready by next week. I left my sisters talking there with this lady and I decided to take a look through the window. The place was disgusting. It gave me the creeps. There were holes in the walls, the carpet had a huge black hole in the middle of it, and it looked like someone had started a fire there. It made me think someone had done some witchcraft there. My first thought was why did this lady ask us to come look at it when it hadn't even been cleaned yet? It irritated me. My sisters were friendly with this woman who was a friend of one of my sisters, so maybe that's why. Anyway, it's not that important. A week goes by and we go look at the place and it's perfectly clean. We start moving in that week. This place had the living room and kitchen on the bottom floor and the first two bedrooms were upstairs. The first thing you see when you walk in the place is the living room and the stairs. My two sisters and I were to share the bigger room and my sister and her husband would take the smaller one. We planned on buying another bed in the next week or so so we decided to take turns sleeping on the floor. With days going by and acclimating to the townhouse, there was something about it that unsettled me. I could never point point it, but I was scared of the place and didn't know why. At night, we'd hear people walking up and down the stairs and we'd tell ourselves, oh, it's just noisy neighbors. Then the baby crying every night was the other ordeal we had to work around. Our bedroom, the one me and my sister shared, also shared a wall with the next door neighbors. We could hear at nights when the parents would come in and try to comfort their child. The baby would stop fussing and we'd eventually all fall asleep. The crying baby was mostly what bothered me the most. It bothered me because it was a nightly ordeal. It was so bad that I considered speaking to the neighbors about it or calling CPS on them. It really made me fed up. I was concerned for the child. Finally, one night we were getting ready for bed. My sister and I were sharing the bed and my other sister was on the floor. We could hear the baby crying and it made me sad to think this poor child was suffering and I couldn't do anything. Then I asked my sister next to me to say a prayer out loud and I asked to please include the baby next door. My sister started to pray. Jehovah God that you're in heaven, thank you for what you've given us today. Thank you for providing us the things we need. Please, we ask you to protect the child next door. My sister goes quiet. My other sister jumps in bed with us. At that very moment, all three of us are feeling the exact same thing. An enormous entity has entered our room. It came from the child's room. It feels like it's filled the entire bedroom. We're laying in bed terrified. I tell my sister to continue praying. Keep praying, Kate, she continues. Jehovah God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, remove whatever is in this room with us. Please protect us and the child next door from any evil and harm. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We stayed silent for what felt like 10 long minutes, but I'm sure it was only a few seconds. I asked my sister, did you feel it too? One of my sisters says, yes, it was huge. She says, I'm just glad we have Jehovah to protect us. We slept soundly that night, as well as the baby next door. We prayed out loud every night since, and nothing ever bothered us or the child again. My grandparents and great-grandfather used to own and live on a farm. A bit run down by the time I was born, but I remember it well still. My great-grandfather died in an annex to the farm where he had his own living space, etc. 
The farm itself was getting old a few hundred years from the original cottage it was built around. So my grandparents decided to sell it to a pretty wealthy guy. Let's call him Dan, who renovated it and made it look real nice again and modern. We stayed good friends after we took ownership, so we got there often enough. Now I've had dreams of ghosts at the farm, but never experienced it myself, but I shall tell you what others there have experienced. My grandfather had had dreams of his dad, who was my great grandfather, who died in the annex. Come to visit him at night merely to tell him that he was gone. Dream or real, he was never sure. Also, the usual familiar smells in certain rooms are nothing crazy. My grandmother had less aggressive happenings than others, such as footsteps that faded off, only for a door to slowly swing open. The smell of tobacco smoke from the labourer that once worked for them, and the piano would play a key every now and then. The two dogs they had would go crazy in the room with the piano, but they always barked at me and my brother, so I thought they were bastards anyway. My grandmother was always interested in my dreams about the farm, as if I was a paranormal investigator or something. But anyway, various creaks and knocks are always heard, but it's an old place. One could easily shrug it off as wind or the dog moping around. One night, Dan was sitting in the lounge, watching TV with his young son. When he swears, something touched his hair quite blatantly. Dan shrugs it off as he's sceptical about such things. Later that week, lying in bed, the call of nature wakes Dan up. Also, he notices it's surprisingly cool in the room for the time of year, but then he can't get up. Something is physically forcing him down in his bed. Dan is a giant man as well. He can't even struggle. It's as if a weight is on every inch of his body. It seems nearly five minutes of oppression before he shouts, fuck off me. Does the weight subside and he can move again? Either way, he never ended up going to the bathroom until morning after that. My family never had a bad experience at the farm with regards to the supernatural. I personally found some rooms creepy and the long corridors unnaturally spooky, but at the same time, I never felt threatened. I sometimes wonder whether it's family members' ghosts, which is why it's more amiable towards us than visitors to the farm. One year, my mother took us kids to a state park for summer vacation. She wasn't into going camping, so she rented a family cabin at the park. The cabin was picturesque, with native stone walls topped by brown plank trim, and it featured a small bedroom, a kitchen, bathroom, and had two couches in the living room. One of the couches was a hide bed, the other was not. A wall plaque informed us that the park cabins had been built by the WPA in the 1930s. We arrived in the late afternoon and began unloading the car for our three-day stay. I was to hang our clothes in the tiny closet, and as soon as I opened the closet door, I got a bad case of creepy chills. Though the west-facing cabin door was open and sunshine was streaming into the room, not one ray of light penetrated into the closet. It was like the light just stopped when it struck the open closet door. The wood trim along the opening gleamed in the mellow light, but the interior was pitch black. I couldn't find the rod to hang the clothes on. I didn't want to enter the closet to feel for the rod, and there didn't seem to be a closet light. Mom brought the flashlights. Hmm. The batteries must be low, but we could dimly see the clothes rack. My sister, 13, and I, 11, would sleep on the pull-out couch. My little brother at 18 months would get the other couch, and mom would sleep in the little bedroom. Unpacking finished, we hurried outside to enjoy the mountain scenery while it was still light. That night, mom left the bathroom light on with the door nearly closed. This made a nice dim nightlight in a strange place, except for the closet next to the bathroom. We had all been asleep for a while when I woke up without knowing why. Something wasn't right. I hadn't been aware of hearing anything, but something wasn't right. I studied the room carefully, nothing. 
I panned across the room again, and that's when I saw a very tall man leaning forward over my little brother on the opposite couch. The man was wearing a tan trench coat like in the old Humphrey Bogart movies and a 1940s era brown hat. His back was to me and he appeared to be studying the sleeping child. I couldn't move, couldn't even breathe. Little brother's eyes opened. He looked up at the man and began screaming bloody murder. The man just faded out. He didn't leave, but he was gone. Now mom's up, all the lights are on, brother's still screaming and won't settle down. Sister sits up rubbing her eyes groggily, what's going on? Meanwhile I'm yelling hysterically, there was a man, there was a man in here. Mom checks the exit door next to the brother's couch, it's locked. She grabs a skillet from the kitchen and checks the bathroom, the closet. Go back to the flashlights because it's dark in the closet, nothing. Sister gets up and grabs little brother. He begins to calm down, but he's clutching her neck so hard, it hurts. A thorough rehashing of events didn't lead to any conclusions. Sister insisted that I'd had a nightmare. I countered, what about brother? Did he have one too? Mom didn't have much to say, just mostly looked thoughtful. She had never allowed us to watch ghost or monster movies for fear that it would give us nightmares. Finally, she said we should all go back to bed and talk about it in the morning. She tried to put brother back down on the couch, but he kicked and cried so much she wound up taking him to bed with her. She left the kitchen light on this time and we finally got back to sleep. Next morning at breakfast, mom explained a little about ghosts and how this might be one. She said ghosts were lost or confused souls. It couldn't actually hurt us. After our day's activities, we would pray for the ghost and it should go away. It didn't. After our prayer session, mom left the bathroom light on, with the door open, just in case. I wanted to go home. Brother still couldn't stand the sight of the couch. Sister resented the fuss because her sunburn was bothering her. Brother was to sleep with us on the pullout. I thought I'd never get to sleep, but finally did. Again, suddenly, I'm wide awake. I look around and don't see anything at first. There he is, emerging from the closed closet door and walking slowly across the kitchen. Again, I can only see him from behind. In spite of the nightlight, the closet area is still shadowed. He disappears into the little bedroom where mom is sleeping. I wanted to call out a warning, but was frozen with fear. A minute passes, then another. A crashing sound from the bedroom, my mother's voice loud and commanding. Out! Get out! Lights on, rerun of last night. Mom said she woke up to see the man standing at the foot of her bed. As her eyes travelled up from the belt of his trench coat, the figure seemed to solidify. Details became sharper. She looked at his face. There wasn't one. An automotive coil shock absorber emerged from the neck of the trench coat, and disappeared into the fedora hat. It raises its arms like a Bela Lugosi monster or a priest giving benediction and begins falling forward onto the bed. Right before it hit the bed, it disappeared. The crashing sound came from mom knocking her water glass and the bedside lamp onto the floor when she went for the light. Mom agreed that we would cut the vacation short and leave as soon as it was daylight. Even though she doubted that the park would refund the unused day of the cabin rent, just her to worry about that. Sister had to fetch our clothes from the closet as I flatly refused to go near it. She had to use the flashlight. So from the beginning, I wake up in my mum's house. It's the last day of the month. It's time to move out or be thrown out. My mum did give me two weeks notice that she wanted me out on this day. However, I thought she was then just in a bad mood. However, I was wrong. That morning she wanted me gone. It was a Saturday morning. I had just been paid from the job centre. It wasn't a lot of money, but enough in my mum's mind to get me started. After an argument, I left with a small bag of clothes and my laptop. I took my laptop in spite of my mum using it more than I did. I took a train from Barry Island to Cardiff, then to Newport City, then another bus to a village called Ringland. 
I met with two of my mates. I paid them half of my money to score me half an ounce of amphetamine. As soon as I get it, I swallow one gram. It stopped me worrying about being homeless. And at 11 a.m., I'm planning my weekend and who I'm spending it with. This was my life every other weekend. No sleep, smoking fags, drinking lager. From Saturday morning, taking drugs. To Monday morning, catching a train back to my mum's with all the people going to work. I wonder why they're all staring at me. I must have looked so rough. Also, a shit example to the school kids catching the same train. I dressed well, but I was becoming very skinny. And I'm very happy I couldn't see the real look of my eyes after being awake all weekend. I look back and feel embarrassed and realise why my mum had to get me out. So I've had my drug fueled weekend, I'm out of money, and reality kicks back in and I remember I'm homeless. I'm verbally abusive to my mum over the phone because she will not allow me back there. I'm on a come down. I'm paranoid and a worried mess. I wonder if my nan will let me there, I think. She lives in a town not far from Newport. I walked seven miles to her house. She lets me in. She knows why I'm there. She probably expected me. I would never swear in front of my nan. Not because she was strict, because she's the nicest, calmest woman in the world and to this day, I don't think I've ever heard her swear or say a bad word about anyone. I'm angry, I'm swearing, I'm frustrated about my mother throwing me out. I'm calling my nan's daughter a few bad words. I'm so lucky my nan didn't throw me out then. She then probably sees my real attitude and understands my mother's reason. My nan agrees to let me stay, but only until the morning. Then she will help me find some type of accommodation. She doesn't want me on the streets. I slept on a sofa. I needed it. It's now Tuesday morning. It's going to be a long day. Me and my nan catch a bus into Newport. My mum accepts an apology and decides to catch two trains to Newport to help. We search all day. We're close to giving up. I'm panicking. Then we see a sign in the window of an empty flat. It has a mobile number and the landlord's name. The downstairs flat looks empty. I think it looks perfect. My mum dials the number. The landlord answers and advises the downstairs flat is not available at this time. However, he tells us he has a shared house on Carlion Road with one room available. We were to meet him there in one hour. He can show us in and see what we think. For me, massive relief. In my head, I'm thinking I'm accepting before I've seen it. Then 30 seconds go by and we figure we don't actually know where this road is. We ask someone walking by. They tell us we're about 30 minutes walk away. We got there, but it took longer. My nan's in her 60s and has a driving license, but doesn't have a car. My mum never felt the need to pass a driving test. In South Wales, the buses were regular. Trains and buses on the doorstep almost. Plus, she could carry more bags of shopping than the average car boot. We arrive at the shared house before the landlord. My first thought is that it's massive. It's on a busy road and next to a flyover bridge that trains go over two ways. The house is actually taller than the bridge. Outside, I'm thinking of the times I used to walk under the bridge past this house every day. I would be on my way to a work placement in a charity shop half a mile away from the bridge and house. I loved it there. It was called St. David's Foundation. The job centre had me a work placement there for 13 weeks. I used to walk past this house and wonder who lived there as the drive we now stood in waiting for the landlord was always occupied by a couple of men working in cars or other days about four cars and no people. However, the drive was empty that day. No one there, no sign of anybody. We took a look through the letterbox. We could see a closed door to the right and a flight of stairs ahead. I remember seeing the stairs and wondering how old the carpet was. Maybe 1960s looking at the pattern. Just as we were getting worried, the landlord turned up on a motorbike. He pulled off his helmet and apologised. He told us he was a teacher and was stuck at the school. My mum obviously fancied this guy. Later on, she admitted she thought he was nice. She was into her hard looking men. He introduced himself. All I could think of is that I never used to get along with my teachers and probably had a shit attitude around him. I can't really remember. The landlord got his huge sets of keys out and led us to the front of the building and let us on the front door. The door was a huge, big, solid wooden door. 
Around the door were huge green plants that grew up the whole front of the house. Looking back at it, definitely looked creepy. We were led up three sets of stairs. At the top of the third set was a creaky door when it opened and slammed shut by a spring. Then immediately on the right and left opposite each other were rooms five and six. My room would be six. The door I remember looking at, like an old classroom door, light brown with a window at head height. This window had a purple bit of cloth hanging over like a curtain. He turned the key and we walked in. Surprisingly, it looks modern. It's the size of an average kitchen with laminate flooring and nothing else in it, apart from a sink and two cupboards underneath the sink. Looks perfect to me. The landlord explains this can be temporary and when one of his properties becomes available, he can let me know and I can have one. I'm just happy with what I'm seeing at the moment. He then explains he requires in advance a payment of £230, a month's payment if I want to move in today. I'm thinking great, I've just spent £120 on the weekend and no money left. I'm gutted. Just as all the hope was drained out of me, my nan got out a brown envelope full of money and gave me the £200. I can't remember her even going to the bank I thought, or even having a discussion that I may have needed some money today, or I would have accepted a life on the streets until my next pay packet. Whatever happened, my mum and nan knew I wouldn't have had any money left on that day. The landlord welcomes me and says the house with six rooms is now occupied. He started telling me about the people who lived in each room. I can only remember him telling me about the lad the same age as me, who lived opposite me in number five, and the mechanic who lived there for a long time and could probably show me a few things, as I told him I was interested in cars and previously studied mechanics myself. Before the landlord left me to it, he told me he'd come back on the last day of the month and collect £30 for electricity and water. He left and then I realised I needed to get some things together from my mum's. I thanked my nan, probably not enough, and I took the two trains back to my mum's and grabbed my small TV, a few clothes and a couple of DVDs and CDs and a blow up bed, whatever I was able to carry really. I said my goodbye for now. She told me she was sorry. I thanked her for helping out. I felt this would have to be the time to change my ways. I took the two trains back to Newport Station and walked half a mile to my new room. I got to the house, walked the three sets of stairs through the loud banging door and then into my room. I still see no one. I pumped up my airbed that I blew up with a very loud electric pump. I set up my TV. It was now about 8 p.m. It was a long day and I took a look out the only window. I could see a small bit of the main road and the driveway outside, with now a white van reversed into it. The main view was the railway track that ran across the top of the bridge. I was looking down on that bridge in my room. Apart from the squashed fly on the window, that was all I could see. I had a couple of pounds in my wallet. I decided to go down to the shop which was towards where I used to work in the charity shop, but not as far. On the way, I thought maybe I could call tomorrow and see if they needed any help. I got to the shop and bought two litres of white cider. I thought to myself, I'm on my own in a new place. I'm quite nervous and I'll sleep well. After this, I remember getting back to my room and drinking from the bottle as I had no cups. I did nothing else apart from that and watched TV. Then the next thing, I know I woke up in the morning around 5am on top of a blown up bed recognising that I still had half a bottle of cider left beside me, with the top unscrewed. I looked ahead of me, getting used to my new surroundings, and realising the cupboard doors under the sink are wide open. I'm thinking to myself, I can't even remember even opening in them. If I did, I'm sure I would have closed them, and then thinking about the one litre of white cider I drank. That was nowhere near enough to drink to make me pass out the way I did. Human nature is normal to ignore these things and put it to the back of your head and carry on. However, trying to ignore the weird dream I had that night of being strangled was slightly more difficult to forget, but I went on with my day and didn't question it again. Until 10 years on, I'm questioning this first night along with many other events that continue to go around in circles in my everyday thoughts. A cheeky situation 
that happened to my friends and me in the middle of summer in Denver, round about 2008. We were bored and sitting around telling stories about the random things that we've done in life. And my time working as a locator for a paranormal hunting group came up. Basically, I was the one who would look for potential haunts and I would contact the owner of whatever property they were going to hunt. And I would arrange the whole thing permission wise. The group had a lawyer and insurance that handled the waivers and such. I just got them all in touch with each other to make sure everything was above board and legal. All that the owner wasn't held liable in one of my idiot hunters went screaming into a hole on the property in the middle of the night. Well, that interested a friend who at the time was a skeptic of the paranormal. One of my roommates mentioned our basement was haunted, a recurring theme in my life, I know. The skeptic said we should do an investigation, which translated into there being six of us in the basement, sitting in a semicircle with some equipment asking questions. Most of the people don't matter, save Rob, my best friend, and Goldie, our skeptic friend. Goldie didn't believe in the paranormal and was adamant that all those people are con artists. I guess that included me too, but no worries, I don't take things personally. The basement was an unfinished large room with a metal pole in the middle. We were sitting in front of that pole and I pulled out a couple things I still had left over from when the paranormal hunting group broke up. The equipment that was the most important to this situation was the thermometer and the recorder. When we started, I gave Goldie the thermometer and Rob was the recorder guy. Rob had done investigations with me a couple times in the past, just the two of us, and he knew to call out shuffling or whispered conversation to mark it on the audio. He was also my sound guy in general. Anytime I got audio evidence, he was the one that found it for me. So the call outs were to help him sort the sounds of playbacks. So we sat and Goldie commented how warm the basement was. It was a hot day and there was no AC venting into the basement. The thermometer said it was in the low 80s. So we sat there for a while asking questions and goofing around in the dark. No one was taking this seriously. After some time, I realized half of my body was very cold. Goldie commented almost immediately after that. It felt freezing in the room now. She shined a light on the thermometer and it was down to 44 degrees Fahrenheit. We were staring at the red out silently while Rob suddenly yelped and jumped up, then took off up the stairs. We followed after into the warm upper level and Rob was pacing around all hyper and freaked out. This guy was a rock and here he was babbling like a scared child. Once I calmed him down, he told me what had happened. As we were looking at the temperature, he heard a whisper in his ear and felt a shocking cold sensation on his crotch. Not one to be interested in that kind of experience with the dead, he freaked out and took off. We didn't have any evidence except his recounting of that uncomfortable situation until we reviewed the audio. There, right between me commenting about how the temperature had dropped 40 degrees and Rob jumping out of his seat, a clear female voice can be heard saying, I'm so alone. Goldie freaked out since she was the only woman in the room at the time and this voice was right next to the mic while she was at least eight feet away from me. These days, Goldie is much more open to the idea of ghosts and spirits. And that's the story of the lonely ghost or the time Rob got groped by the undead. Between the ages of five and six, 1987 to 88, I lived in a house along the Penned Oriel River in Northern Idaho. My parents were renting it and it would be the last house we all lived together in as a family. If anyone is following along from my other stories, you're gonna learn pretty quickly that I moved around a lot as a kid, never in one place for more than three years from 1982 to 1997. I wish we had bought that house. I loved it there. The house itself wasn't creepy. It was half a trailer connected to a large wooden building. The trailer section had two bedrooms, a bathroom, 
and was connected to the larger building by a short, thin hallway that contained a washer and dryer. We called it the washroom. The main part of the house had a living room with attached dining room, a kitchen and the master bedroom with a master bath. All in all, it was a great size for my family of five. My brother, sister, mother, father and me. The best part about it was we had the largest amount of waterfront property along our little neighbourhood. Everything about my life at the time was going great because I was five and my biggest concern in life was how I was going to get the Ghostbusters firehouse place it. The only thing that was really a problem was that I was afraid of the dark. At that time, I had no reason to be. The only weird thing I ever experienced was in broad daylight and things had yet to go bump in the night for me. But my fear often had me sleeping in the beds of others. I shared a room with my brother in the trailer. My sister had her own room, also in the trailer. Sometimes I'd get scared and try to sleep in my brother's bed. He wasn't keen on that idea, so he would make me sleep at the foot of the bed like the dogs do. I wasn't comfortable doing that regularly, so oftentimes I would choose to go to my parents' bedroom and sleep between them. But making that trip meant going through the washroom, where the dryer was. Something about that short little hallway at night sent shivers down my spine, and I hated if the dryer was left open, because it would scare me. So I always ran through that hallway, holding my pillow like a shield. I never slept without my pillow, which was nothing special, except I had a pillowcase that had a cat wearing red sneakers on it. Well, one night, after a particularly bad nightmare, I decided that I needed to sleep in the same bed as someone to make the scary go away. I tried my brother, but he wouldn't wake up, and I knew I wasn't supposed to sleep in his bed without permission. So I decided it was going to be the parents' room that night. I grabbed my pillow and softly padded through the trailer, past our bathroom, and to the washroom hallway. I remember the hallway that night with perfect visual clarity. There was a fish tank in the living room with a light that cast a dim glow into the washroom. I remember clearly the pile of clothing to my right, stuff that needed to be washed, and the washer and dryer to my left. I remember the dryer door was open. I hated that it looked like a big hungry mouth and that the light didn't shine into it from the fish tank. I steeled myself and I charged forward, hugging my pillow tightly. I rushed past the washer and then the dryer, and just as I was excited that I had made it, something grabbed me. I could feel cold, long fingers wrap around my torso. In my mind, I've always imagined them to be long, knobbly hands with sharp fingers. I cried out and dropped my pillow, and I was tugged backwards. I remember the feeling of the opening of the dryer scraping against my arms and head, and I felt myself bend at the waist, painfully. I heard the dryer room slam shut after I was pulled into it. Then I jerked awake. I was in my bed, alone in the dark and scared to death. I was too scared to leave the bedroom again, so I just cried into my blankets and fell back to sleep. That would have been it. Just a bad nightmare that I never would even think to be anything else. I wouldn't even post something like that here if it hadn't been for what happened when my mom woke me up in the morning. She brought my pillow into my room with her and said she found it in front of the dryer. It's been 23 years since then. I don't remember a whole lot about our time in that house and I don't remember how I reacted when my mom gave me my pillow. But my mom remembers. I was talking to her about this story and if what I remembered about the house was accurate, and I asked if I had ever told her about the dryer grabbing me. She told me about the day she found my pillow in front of the dryer. When she gave it back to me, I started crying. I told her about my dream, and I promised I'd never go to her room to sleep again. The reason she remembers that is because I never did sleep in her room again, and she found my story about what had happened to be super creepy. I can't tell you if this actually happened or if it was a crazy dream where I sleepwalked and dropped my pillow in the washroom and then went back to bed. But I figured it was spooky enough to share and it is as true as I know it to be. I'm still super picky about sleeping with my pillow and every dryer I've ever purchased has to have a light in it. 
Not a conscious choice because of this incident. Just something I've realized I look out for in a dryer that I thought was kind of funny. So this is the beginning of the most terrifying paranormal thing that ever happened to me. I lived in a house up in the very northern tip of Idaho, right about 1992 to three. The house is still there today, still in exactly the same shape outside. But I hope for the sake of the current owners that they remodeled and repaired the basement. The basement wasn't huge. It had a large main room, basically a wide hallway. It had two doors leading to two small bedrooms. There was an uncarpeted cement floor and a little nook under the stair opposite the two rooms that were used for storage. In the spring, during the melt, the groundwater would leak into the basement due to a faulty sump pump. Because of that, the whole place would smell of mildew and mold. I'm fairly certain I spent a small chunk of my life living with some sort of mold in my bedroom. Probably not healthy and it could have accounted for the weird things that happened in that dingy basement. I would believe that if the events that span this tale hadn't taken me into my adult life and several states away. It all started with a puppet, a snail puppet named Snaily. When I was about six, my family gave him to me, a glorified sock puppet with a long tube neck for my arm and a shell at the back. I was very good at making it talk for me and giving it expression. I even figured out how to make him retreat into the shell when he was upset. I really enjoyed it and planned on making a life out of it. So much so that on my seventh birthday, my grandparents gave me a Muppet. He was a gray, furry fellow with a big felt mouth and a stick attached to one arm. His legs ended in Velcro covered feet that could wrap around me and seem like he was sitting on my hip. I fell in love. He was an extension of me, always on my hip and always cracking jokes. I loved that little fuzzball and started looking up ventriloquism at my library. My grandfather caught wind of my interest and decided he would help me by getting me a ventriloquist dummy. It was a cheap replica of Charlie McCarthy, the famous dummy that all Hollywood dummies are based on. The doll was awesome to the seven-year-old budding ventriloquist inside me. I didn't care that he only had a cheap pull string to make him talk, and that his velvet hat fell off his head every time I moved him. I loved him. When my family split, he ended up going with my father while I lived with my mom in Utah. Eventually, we bounced from place to place, splitting our time between my mother and father in different states. Thus, in the final half of the fifth grade, I moved back to Idaho, into my father's new home, and into a hellish nightmare that was that basement. When I moved back in, I got a lot of toys my father had been storing, including Charlie. By that time, I was nearly 11, and I had forgotten about my love for ventriloquism. But seeing Charlie again reignited that flame, and I was at it again. Until a couple of months later, when I got my first computer. Suddenly, learning DOS Basic and playing Wolfenstein 3D became my new obsession. I cast Charlie into my mouldy closet and moved on to more adult things. Eventually, he was put away by my father for safekeeping. From the moment I moved into that house, the basement was my greatest fear. When I found out my dad was sticking me in the dingy, unfinished basement bedroom with no carpet and mold on the walls, I pitched a fit. Not because it was gross, but because I was terrified of that whole space. The stairs leading up to the house were open-faced. I could see into the small storage space under the stairs, and it always felt like something was back there, waiting to grab my legs. I used to bucket up the stairs at top speed, in hopes to avoid that fate. The only light in the main room was a single bulb, hanging at the end of a long wire. It wasn't designed to be like that. The wire should have been in the ceiling, and the bulb was hanging from the mount that should have been attached to the ceiling. My father mounted it twice during my stay in that house. Both times it was down and swinging within a week. There was a wood-burning stove in the middle of the main room. It needed to be fed every couple of hours during the winter to keep the house warm. Of course, as someone who's terrified of the basement, the job of feeding the fire fell on my scrawny little shoulders. 
So it was one day in the middle of the winter, I was in the basement feeding the fire. Since I had moved in there, I had experienced weird things. Bumps in the night, stuff falling off a shelf while no one was near, the normal. However, this was the first time I had lived there that something truly terrifying happened to me. As I was struggling to open the door to the stove, I heard a deep guttural growl from below the stairs to my right. I froze, hoping it was my dog hunting mice and slowly, without looking at the stairs, loaded the fire with a couple logs. I closed the door to the stove and slowly turned to look at the stairs, when behind me I heard a voice clear as day, I will kill you, whispered in a harsh, deep male voice. I lost my shit. I screamed and ran up the stairs. I think I only touched three steps of the 13 leading up to the main house. I ran to the back of the house. A new addition, by new, read 40 years old, and huddled under the blankets crying. I never wanted to go back into the basement, but eventually I had to go back to my room. From that point all, Every bump, every scrape, every little sound had me on edge while I was down there. Time passed. Eventually, I put the voice into the back of my mind, convincing myself I had imagined it. I always had a rational mind, one that I used to explain away all the strange things that happened to me. Finally, as things tend to do, it was pushed into the back of my mind, and I lived with just a general fear of the basement again. Until one day again while feeding the fire. I got a sense of dread in my chest, something I couldn't put my finger on, but it got my pulse racing. I began to nope it up the stairs, when the one thing I had always feared happened. Something grabbed my leg from under the stairs. I freaked and went lightheaded. I couldn't figure out what was happening. I couldn't decide if this was real life or a dream. I know I jumped backwards, I was nearly at the top of the stairs, and I didn't land on a single step on the way down. The way my body twisted as I pulled away from something holding me had me land square on my back on solid concrete. I felt the wind rush from my lungs, and then I passed out. I don't know if it was from the impact or fear, I just know I lost consciousness. I don't know how long I was out. I do know when I came to, my head hurt more than it ever had in my life. I was dizzy and not fully aware of my surroundings, and I crawled up the stairs and into the main part of the house. I lay down on the couch and fell asleep. My dad got home a few hours later and woke me up. I told him what had happened. He looked me over for any serious injury before telling me it must have been a dream. I was tired and lethargic for a few days after that, but eventually I felt normal, and I ended up deciding it had to be a dream. Stuff like that didn't happen in real life. My brother knew of my fears and would torment me as much as possible, jumping out at me or sending me to get things from the basement just because he knew I was afraid. The worst thing he did to me though was move stuff around my room at night. My room didn't have a door, so it was easy to sneak in and move stuff around. He would put my toy chest in front of the doorway or turn my desk upside down and put my chair on it. Never anything subtle about it. I didn't want to fuel his behaviour, so I never got upset about it. I just moved things back. My mum always told me he would grow tired of his pranks if he didn't think they were working. Old school, don't feed the trolls moment. Eventually it stopped. Or so I thought. One night, my brother's prankster spirit came out in full force. I woke up to a loud knock on my closet wall. I looked over, and in the light of the nightlight, I could see my dummy Charlie sitting on top of my toy chest, facing me. I laughed a little nervously. Charlie had been put away in a garbage bag with all the other stuffed animals I didn't use any longer. The bag was stored in a shed in the backyard. I was proud of my brother for the effort. This had more subtlety and class than his other pranks I fell back to sleep. A while later, I was awoken to another knock and I sat up hoping to catch my brother doing something else. This time, Charlie was on the floor sitting upright facing my bed. I rolled my eyes and sighed. I respected the conviction, but I was too tired to deal with it anymore, so I fell back to sleep. One last time, I was woken up. This final time, the doll was on my chest. 
I flipped shit and ran into my brother's room, yelling at him to stop messing with me. The only problem was his room was empty and it slowly dawned on me that he hadn't been home all day and was planning on spending the night at his friend Nick's house. I had been alone in the basement all night. It was quite some time later that I discovered he had never moved anything in my room. In fact, by all accounts, my brother did everything he could to not go into my room and gave him the creeps. I felt like I was going insane. I couldn't fathom how the doll had ended up on my chest or how it got inside in the first place. I ran upstairs, crying uncontrollably. My dad's door was locked, so I climbed onto the couch and fell asleep with my face buried in fear. The next day, I woke up on the couch and it all felt like a dream. Still, I was done with the basement. I started sleeping on the pull-out couch after that. I don't remember the story I told my dad, something about the mould bugging me, but I never slept in that room again. Luck was on my side, and the basement started to flood heavily the next few months. And my dad eventually moved me into the room upstairs with my sister. I thought my troubles were over, but that was just the beginning of the nightmare that spanned almost 10 years of my life. After Charlie had shown back up in the basement, I refused to sleep down there ever again. It was the first time I stood up to my father about anything. He tried to force me to stay in the basement, but I'd wait until he was asleep, then move myself to the den and sleep on the couch. He'd get up for work every day to find me sleeping on that couch. Eventually, he stopped trying to make me go into the basement. It was summer by this time, and I have fond memories of staying up all night playing NES, and then riding my bike to the beach every morning to swim for hours. Despite what happened near the end of the season, I still hold that to be the best summer of my life because I felt so free. I slept in that den for the whole summer, but my dad didn't like the idea of me sleeping on the couch all the time. So eventually, he moved my bed and my toys into my sister's room. This was 93, so she would have been eight at the time, and I was just about to make that full-time rush into puberty, which made that situation uncomfortable to me. However, we made do and I just avoided the room unless I was sleeping. But I had to maintain her bedtime, so I was in bed super early, and I didn't like that. I made do by reading under the blankets and playing my Game Boy by the light of my book lights. No big deal, I adapted, but I missed the freedom of the den. When my dad moved all the toys in my bed into the room, I distinctly told him to put Charlie back into the shed. I watched him throw it in the plastic bag that had all my other dolls and puppets from my younger years. He wasn't pleased that I made him do this, saying I was being dumb and I needed to grow up and stop dragging him into my games of pretend. Well, one night before school started, I was sleeping soundly on my back, something I never do anymore, when I felt a weight on my chest. It was heavy and, I don't know how to say this any other way, pointy. Like there were odd angles to it, pressing into me. At first, I thought it was my dog, a 40 pound Springer Spaniel, but it felt wrong, too small. I know this sounds like a sleep paralysis demon, but two things pushed this outside sleep paralysis for me. One, I started flailing immediately, no paralysis involved. And two, I opened my mouth to scream when something hard and plastic shot into it and pressed into the back of my throat. I flailed around, grabbing at the thing on my chest, but it was weird, like it was covered in a cloth that had a lot to give. But it was also firm and heavy for something so small. The top of it was round plastic, and I kept trying to push it, but it wasn't moving, and I couldn't roll to my side. Eventually, in my wild attempt to get this thing off me and out of my mouth, I was barely able to breathe, and I've had a distinct fear of suffocation ever since this day. My hand latched onto a part that was hanging off the main mass. A single string at the base of the hard plastic on top. That's when I realised what this was. It was Charlie. I could feel it now. The weight of him on my chest was like someone had filled him with lead instead of fluff. It was his hand in my mouth, making me gag again as it tried to push deeper in. I think realising what was on me helped me panic less. I felt like I needed to see him. I needed to make him real, I guess. So I fumbled around, 
grabbed my book light and turned it on. The second there was light in the room, the doll was just that, a doll. He slumped off my chest and the wet cotton arm that ended in a rigid plastic hand fell out of my mouth as if I had been sucking on it, not choking on it. I stared hard at the doll, coughing and crying and scared as hell. I had realised earlier this summer, no one in my house cared about what was happening to me, and I had nowhere to run. I simply sat in bed with the small ring of the light illuminating that damn doll, something I used to love and now despised. I don't know how long I sat there. By the time the batteries died on my light, the sun was coming up, casting a soft light in the room. By the time I left the room, my throat was extremely sore. I never fell back asleep. I know that much for sure. It's the only reason I don't think it was all a bad dream. Well, that and the other nightmarish things that happened involving that doll. That day, after my father had left for work, I took my frustrations out on that doll. I smashed his face in. I kicked him. I took him and swung him around, smacking him against my porch outside. I was working some stuff out, okay? After that, I took him back into the shed and saw that the bag he was in had a small hole in it about the size of his head. So I wasn't gonna take any chances. I put him in a toy chest I had in the shed. It was a square with the Ninja Turtles painted on all sides with a lid that locked. I shoved him in there and locked the lids declaring victory, which worked for a while. I didn't see him again that summer. I had a different supernatural encounter with a being the internet has begun to call the Hatman, I guess. I didn't know he was basically a cryptid but apparently he's a big deal and has a sub dedicated to him. I'll leave that one for now. This story isn't about him. The last time I saw Charlie in Idaho was after school had started. I had just come home from school and my girlfriend had come home with me. She was a cool kid. I really liked her, despite not knowing what a romantic relationship really was. But this was the last time we ever hung out. We got home and dumped our backpacks on the floor next to my front door and sat down to watch Star Trek TNG. It's part of why we were friends. She loved Star Trek and so did I. We watched it together every day after school until her mom picked her up. It should be noted that though the backpacks weren't visible to us, from where my couch was, the only way to get to the bags was to pass by us, in between us and the TV screen. Kind of hard to miss. Well, halfway through the episode, we were watching our backpacks flew across the room. They didn't roll or slide. They passed in front of the TV, in the air, like someone had chucked them. She screamed, I screamed. There was no ice cream involved. We ran over to the bags. Then we looked back at where they came from. Sitting against the door with a smug air about him was Charlie. It was like he was taunting me. The girl didn't know what was happening or why I was so much more freaked out than her. My mind was racing and I decided the only thing to do was to make sure he was gone forever. Now, an adult would think fire, but to a sixth grader, fire was not on the menu. I decided to bury him and the girl got conscripted into helping me. She was scared and confused, but eventually she did help. I got my dad's shovel and took Charlie to the woods behind my house. I dug a deep hole, super deep, to a preteen that had to have been at least three feet. I threw Charlie in and the girl said the, as I was laying down to sleep prayer while I buried him. I don't know what it's called. I never was a church kind of guy, but after I finished it, I put a set of crossed sticks on the dirt and covered the mound with pine needles. And that was it. The girl broke up with me when she left my house that day. The next summer, I moved back in with my mom and never looked back at Charlie or that house again. I never told anyone, neither did the girl as far as I know. Not that it matter. I never saw anyone who knew me from Idaho ever again. Even when I went back, I didn't run into any old friends. So I grew up, moved to California for high school, met a girl and fell in love as one does. Eventually, roughly 1998, my dad moved out to Cali to be closer to the kids he used to neglect and brought with him all the things we had left behind, hoping we would equate nostalgia with love. I kept that Ninja Turtle box out and left the toys in it. Don't worry, it wasn't in the box. The rest of the stuff went into the attic we had, 
a small crawl space with very little room. And that was that. Two years passed after Dad had moved away from that property. It was January of 2000. We had all just survived Y2K. Life was good. I had dropped out of school the year before, so I was working for McDonald's and taking every shift I could. Things were kind of growing stale between me and my girlfriend. We'll call her A. A was kind of mean, honestly. But she was hot and I was fat, so I thought I'd never get anything better. So one day, after a morning shift of work, I came home and she was waiting on my porch. She knew I would be home alone, and she started doing the thing that 17-year-old kids do when they can be alone together. I was also a 17-year-old kid. And though I was beginning to dislike her, I was 17 years old. We went into my house, went into my room, and I was trying to convince her to let me take a shower to get McMuffin stink off of me when she asked why my bed was so dirty. I turned around, and on my bed was a small set of sticks, crossed under a pile of pine needles. That made little sense, because there were no pine needles around my house. Also, dear readers, though you've made the connection, I'm sure, I did not. I simply commented on how weird that was, brushed them onto the floor, and did what I had come to do. It was later. After. We were sitting together talking, and she said something about not knowing I had such a cool doll. I followed her gaze, and sat on the turtle toy box with dear old Charlie. Now, I won't lie to you. I screamed. I got really dizzy, and I thought I was going to pass out. I started hyperventilating as a ton of memories all caught up to me at once. Thing is, though, this guy was fresh. He still had his jacket. I lost it years before the whole basement thing. His hat was perfect. He had his monocle and both shoes. A didn't know why I was freaking out so hard. I asked her to check inside his shoe. She said there was white paint inside with my special mark for my last name. I ran over and grabbed him. As I picked him up, I realised what the pine needles meant. I spun around and looked next to the bed where they had been swept off. There was nothing on my floor. I told A and she started to get why I was so upset. I checked the doll all over. He had the same bald spots, everything. This wasn't just another doll, this was him. A wanted to know the story, so I explained it all to her over my Weber grill. I learned plastic stinks when it burns and leaves a residue at the bottom of charcoal grills. I also learned I wasn't as crazy as I thought, because as he burned, we both swore he was screaming. A part of me wants to think it was just air escaping his head as it melted, but I don't think that's the truth. Anyway, the long-lasting repercussions of these events means I get terrified of any dolls. I can't do ventriloquism, and I can't watch the Goosebumps movies, because guess who R.L. Stein based the books of his haunted dummy off of? I swear everyone steals my life story. Also, my wife, not A, bought a Charlie McCarthy doll from Goodwill just to mess with me. It isn't the same doll. I've never seen it, and I forced her to leave it at her parents' house across the country. She also laughed at me while I was struggling to find a decent picture of him for this story. That's true love right there. I worked at a junkyard when I was in my teens. My boss, Chris, and his family had owned and lived at the junkyard since the 40s. It was his grandfather's and his father's before he took over in the late 80s. One Monday, I came into work to find the shop locked and everyone was up at the house. I walked over and lit a cigarette and wasn't really paying attention to what they were talking about. I looked over to see his sister and wife were in tears and his son was crying. Now his son Josh was seven or eight at the time and he was a good kid who I never saw get into any shit. Chris walked over and told me they were staying shut down for the day and that he'd still pay me for the day. I was like, cool, see you later and got on my car and left. I was an ignorant teenager who only cared about myself and what was going on in my life. So if I could get a paid day off, I'd take it. When I came into work the next day though, I felt horrible and apologized to Chris and asked if everything was okay. So here's the story Chris told me. Josh never knew his great grandfather or grandfather. They were dead long before he was born. 
I never knew the story of how his great grandfather or grandfather died, but I knew his grandfather had killed himself, but never knew how. Supposedly, Josh got up Monday morning and walked into the kitchen, while Chris's sister was picking up photo albums. Josh sat down at the kitchen table and started going through the albums. He looked at his mom and said, hey, I know this guy. Chris's wife sat down and laughed as there was no way Jose could know any of the people in the album. Now Josh has never seen a pic, video, or anything of either of his grandfathers. He was pointing at his grandfather and saying, yes, I do know him. His mom asked how. Josh said he floats in the tree outside his window sometimes. In the early 80s, Chris's dad hung himself in the elm tree that stood outside Josh's window. It completely messed with the family and the photo albums got put away. They hired a local psychic and had her over to look into what Josh said. Of course, all she said was she felt a very strong presence near the tree in Josh's room. They ended up cutting the tree down and moved Josh's room over to the other side of the house. I quit working there after summer and headed back to school. I never worked there again and I don't know what happened to Josh. This was about six years ago, in early 2014. I'm a merchant mariner, and at the time was working on an American flagged car carrier in the engineering department as an oiler. My whole life growing up, I've had some rather strange things happen. Seen some things, felt some things, etc. But this is the first time I've had it happen on a ship I was working on. I was on the midnight to noon watch with the third engineer. When I was in the middle of my readings one evening, I happened to notice an orange blur in my peripheral vision on the deck below, which was the lowest deck in the E slash R. I turned my head and caught just the glimpse of orange overalls walking down the shaft. This wasn't the engineer or anyone else in engineering, as we didn't wear coveralls. Our work outfit consisted of cargo slash mechanic pants and whatever shirt you owned. The deck guys, however, did wear orange. So I finished up my reading and walked down to the lower level to find him, the guy. I thought maybe it could have been the AB on night watch, but they didn't make rounds in engineering spaces, but whatever. So I go down there and no one's there. Whatever, probably just tired, I thought, and finished my rounds. After finishing up, I turned in the sheet to the third in the control room, then stepped back out to go start on a project when I saw the door to the tool room slash machine shop flap closed. Again, I thought probably a decky down here to steal a tool or something. So of course I went to the shop and as I entered the shop, the door to the storage room was just closing. I continued to follow, but there's no one in the storage room. And the only other way out would be through steering and up into the main cargo deck. I continued into steering Gave a quick glance around, again I found nothing. On my way back out, I glanced into the hydraulics room, when I finally saw him. He was facing away from me, looking at a panel and I almost just walked past. I caught myself mid-step and shouted over the sound of the steering pumps to get his attention. The man jumped and was turning around when the ship lost power. Losing power was nothing new. The ship has had a faulty shaft generator for a while. It was pretty standard. I didn't think anything of it until I got my flashlight out of my pocket and the man was gone, like he was never there. I looked around, but nothing. I was starting to get a little nervous and jumpy at that point, but right before panic could set in, the diesel generators kicked in and lights were restored. I returned to the control room to ask the third if Decky had left the engine room. He said no. Cut to a few days later, I was talking with the boatswain's mates in the deck locker when I noticed a picture hanging almost as if it were a memorial. And I asked him about it. The bosun said it had been there for a while. The ship used to be Swedish flagged and they had a death aboard back then before it became US flagged. I sort of went quiet, then told him what I saw a few days ago and he just goes, oh yeah, we catch glimpses of him roaming the cargo deck sometimes too. I didn't have anything else happen that trip 
and we even got the shaft generator fixed in the next port. But still, it was sort of wild having that happen in the last place I'd ever expected. My first experience happened when I was just a couple months old. Clearly, I don't remember it, but my dad does. And I had my first memorable experience when I was six. Things seemed to follow me, or maybe I just ended up in the right place at the right time. Whatever the case, I've had more experiences in 26 years than most people will have in their lifetime. A large chunk of those experiences happened at my dad's house. It's a tiny five-room bungalow, built in the late 30s or early 40s. Metal siding, a small attic, and an even smaller root cellar with an eerie crawl space. It sits on about a half acre of land in a small town that, quite frankly, has a strong, foreboding vibe all of its own. Beyond the backyard is a small cornfield. Beyond that, a woods with a small swamp running through it. That swamp has some stories of its own from what I remember. My dad bought the place when I was 15. I wasn't as excited about moving out of a rusted ancient trailer as I should have been. Dad had spent two or three years looking for an actual house for us. We must have looked at 40 houses at that time, some better and prettier than the bungalow. The first question he asked me the day we started moving our stuff was, what do you think? Is this place haunted? I said, I don't know, but something feels weird. I moved in with him full time when I was 18. Divorced parents, shared custody. That was when things started getting spooky. It wasn't long after dad bought the place that things started happening. Although he didn't tell me about them until I started experiencing them. I'd often smell a smoky floral perfume moving through the house. Sometimes it just smelled like roses. It never stayed in one spot. Dad said he smelled it a lot. Sometimes it was so strong that it woke him up. Footsteps, lots of them. Movement in the attic. There's only one way into the attic, a drop down door above where my bed used to be. Some nights I'd hear walking, stomping, and furniture being dragged up there. However, there was no proper floor up there. If you've ever watched National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and remember the attic scene, you know what I'm talking about. I used to want to be a singer, so I'd spend a lot of my time alone, which was the most of the time, trying to build up my confidence and train my voice by singing loudly. One day, I sang a song pretty damn well, and when I finished, I heard a hearty clapping coming from my bedroom. I just paused and said, thank you. Eventually, more advanced spooky things started happening. The first event I remember was in the middle of a beautiful bright day. I was folding laundry in my bedroom when I heard a large dog barking in the house. I went out to look, thinking one of my neighbour's pit bulls had gotten in. They had tried before, because they think every house is theirs. Not logical now, but at the time, that was my only thought. When I got out there, there was no dog. Nothing was out of place except the dryer was open. I always closed it, because the open door blocked the back door too much. It was also hard to open and had to be slammed shut. The moment I saw the door was when the voices started. Male, female, young, old. They started as a collective whisper that came from every wall in the house and progressed to a mix of whispers, talking, yelling, screaming and crying. The only place it didn't come from was my room, as I found out from running there and curling into the fetal position on my bed. I could hear them from behind my door and soon it sounded like the voices had all congregated right there, trying to get to me, only to be stopped by a flimsy accordion door. I put my hands over my ears and cried. Eventually, he started praying and reciting Psalm 23. I wasn't even that religious at the time. After reciting the psalm, the voice stopped, and I went calm immediately before falling asleep for an hour or so. After I woke up, I went to my friend's house down the road. Her mother hates me to this day and thinks I'm a demon-possessed heathen. 
She didn't think too highly of the story I had to tell. The second event involved the band. I've only seen it once. To get to the only bathroom, you have to go through my dad's bedroom. His bed is right beside the door, and he has under the bed storage drawers. One day, I walked in there and saw that one of the drawers was half open. He never kept the drawers open. As I walked past, a pale grey, long, emaciated arm shot through the door and tried to grab me with spindly fingers. I instinctively jumped over it and went to the bathroom like I'd seen nothing. I figured it was better not to let whatever that was know I was afraid. A couple of days later, I was telling my dad about the arm. I went into his room, which is next to the dining room, and tried to sort of recreate the event. Dad has a corner curio cabinet with a mirrored back in his room. I stood near the bed and looked over the curio cabinets and saw a woman standing behind me. She was white, not Caucasian white, just pure snow white. Her skin, hair, eyes, even her dress, all one even tone. Her hair was up in an antique bun style and her dress looked to be a plain style dress from the late 1800s. While I tried not to let the hand even scare me, this woman drove me over the line. I screamed and started crying. This was my second or third time seeing a full body apparition, but it was the first time I'd ever been so frightened by one. Dad came in, and obviously no one was there. Seeing her was what really started the worst of it. She would end up being a major player in all of this. Sometime between the first meeting her and the most horrifying event involving her, I got a dog. Her name is Ferris, and she's my baby. She had a hard time adjusting, so I spent a lot of time at night with her by my side as I watched movies by myself. Dad worked long hours and was often in bed at eight, so I always closed the French doors between the living room and dining room to keep the noise down. A few days after adopting Ferris, I noticed she would look over the doors and growl. I ignored it for a week or so, chalked it up to her adjusting. Then one night I looked over and really wished I hadn't. On the other side of the doors were hands pressed firmly against the lower panes of glass and figures low to the ground, moving in a slithery, almost slimy way. I couldn't make out the details, but somehow the images of decomposing bodies writhing in pain on the floor came to mind. Instead of freaking out, I turned up the TV volume and watched my movie, all the while glancing over at the figures behind the door. They never left the entire time I was out there. I'd seen them a few times afterwards, but they eventually went away. Ferris always let me know when they were there. They also never left handprints. Then there was Quasimodo. I don't know who or what he was, but I had only ever seen him in the reflection of a full wood and glass curio cabinet that my dad had sitting on top of the TV stand in the living room. He was mostly shadowy, although I could make out certain details like the cut and colour of his hair, his hunched back and twisted arms. The first time I saw him, I looked over at the curio cabinet as I walked through the room and saw him walking closely behind me. It made me jump, but I didn't feel afraid like the white woman did. He didn't stick around long. I wish he could have taken that bitch's place. There was a time when our sump pump malfunctioned and the root cellar flooded. I was woken up by my dad yelling up from beneath the floors. We got a fucking problem down here. I was a bit pissed that he woke me up like that. And if he thought I had some broken appliance spidey sensors that should have woken me up hours ago, just as the pump broke. I asked him later why he woke me up like that. He said, woke you up. I heard you walking around upstairs before I even said anything. We both got a chill from that one. Now for the long story. The day of absolute hell. I hadn't slept well that night. I woke up around 4am. I know this because I could hear my dad out in the kitchen making coffee before he went to work. I'd been woken up to the feeling of someone's entire hand covering my face, using their fingertips to grip tight. I laid still for a while and hoped that it was a dream. Sleep paralysis, maybe. 
but I could move. And when I looked up at the wall, I saw something so incredibly surreal. I used to have a beautiful handmade yarn shawl I got at a thrift store. I kept it hung up on my wall because it was so beautifully made that I considered it a work of art. Popping out of the neck hole of the shawl was a human head. It was pale grey, had dark, almost childlike features, but there was something so menacing about it. I stared at the head for a long time. It stared back at me expressionless and only blinked a couple times. I eventually heard my dad leave and I ran to turn on the light. I never broke eye contact with the head and it never broke eye contact with me. Just like something out of a cheesy horror movie, the moment I turned on the light, the head was gone. I tried going back to sleep with the lights on, but couldn't. I sat out in the living room and watched TV until about 7am. About that time, I felt like my heart was being crushed from within my chest. I saw a pale, transparent figure standing in front of me with its hand to my chest. I recognised it as the white woman and tried to get up. Somehow, she held me down. I reached for my phone to call my mom, but for some reason, the call wouldn't go through. Texts did though. I sent my mom a play-by-play -play of what was going on and told her how scared I was and that I thought the woman was trying to kill me. Of course she was. I used to have screenshots of the texts I sent to my mom, but they became lost after an old phone I kept them on died. The white woman vanished just as I felt like I was going to pass out. Maybe die. I got out of my chair and ran outside. One of my neighbours was out in her car about to go to work. She knew we believed the house was haunted, but never judged us for it. So I ran to her and told her what was going on. She tried to calm me down and told me everything would be okay. She said to call her if anything else happened and she would pick me up and take me back to work with her. I went back inside and immediately regretted it. Walking past my dad's room gave me a terrible feeling. I peeked inside and saw the woman standing in the corner with her back towards me, her chest and shoulders heaving as if she was taking long, laboured but silent breaths. I didn't stick around. I grabbed my purse and keys and ran back outside just before my neighbour was about to go to work. I frantically told her what I saw. If there was any doubt in her mind, it was gone now. She saw how stressed and terrified I was. She walked over to look at the house and then turned to look at me. Behind her, I saw a woman's face staring at me through the kitchen window. I shrieked and watched as the face quickly ducked back to my right. The direction she moved is illogical, since there's a cabinet, sink and wall there. Sometimes I wonder if she left the house for a moment. My neighbour explained to her bosses and co-workers that I was with her because I had some home issues and needed to get out of there. I'm sure they all thought I was on drugs just by looking at me. I was a sleep-deprived mess, dressed in mismatched clothes and slippers. At one point, I tried sleeping on a couch in the lobby. I couldn't sleep. I tried sleeping in the conference room. I couldn't sleep. I wandered the building for a while and eventually made my way to an unused cubicle across from my neighbours. The rest of the day is a blur. Things sort of calmed down after that. There were small experiences here and there, footsteps and smells. I moved out shortly after that for various reasons. I've only been back twice. Dad says those small things happen from time to time, but nothing big. My experiences in general have slowed down. Maybe it's because I'm not seeking anything else. Maybe it's the stress of the tangible world overshadowing anything that may try to show itself to me. Sometimes I miss it. Most of the time, I look back at all the other otherworldly bullshit I've seen and think, nah, I'm good. I was baptised May 20th, 2018, by my cousin, who's a Methodist preacher. At the time, she was a preacher at a church outside Wildwood, New Jersey. Even though my mum and I didn't live in New Jersey, we decided to join the church anyway since it was only a couple hours driving distance. With me were my mom and my dad. The ride up there was fine. We took the same route we always take. I can't tell you highway names or numbers 
or even town names, because I've always been bad at remembering stuff like that. The ride back was what really messed us up. We got onto a stretch of highway that we'd been on numerous times before. My mum knows the way to and from Wildwood by heart, but always has Google Maps up on her phone as backup, just in case. As we went along, things got weird. It wasn't something I could put my finger on right off the bat, but there was this really intense feeling of unease in the environment around us. Eventually, I realised how quiet everything was. My dad talked from time to time, but when he was silent, the whole world was silent. Even the car's engine was eerily silent. After a while, I realised that the highway in the trees around us stopped looking normal. The highway itself was just a straight road for miles and miles ahead of us. No signs, no bends, no curves, no exits, no places to make a U-turn, no buildings off in the distance. The sky and the trees looked grey. Not a rainy day kind of grey, just a nearly colourless grey. I looked over at Mom's phone, which still had maps up, and realised that we were being directed to make a U-turn at some unseen turn-off. Looking at maps, there was nothing around us, just one long, straight highway. The last thing I realised was the lack of other cars. For the past 50 minutes or so, there hadn't been a single car on this desolate, pin-straight highway. Just as I noticed that, Mom and Dad both realised that something was wrong. Mom said she must have missed the exit. Dad said he hadn't seen a single exit for the longest time. I mentioned how the annoying robot chick from Maps hadn't spoken a word in forever. That's what really set the tone for my mom, since that robot voice was something of a running joke with us. We sat in a very uncomfortable silence for a few more minutes, until finally we saw a car, then another, and another. Signs started reappearing, and we found a place to turn around and eventually found our exit. Even the colour came back to the world around us. I've tried talking about this with my parents a few times since it happened. My mom never adds anything to the conversation. Sometimes it seems like she's highly disturbed. My dad and I talked about it once, which made him uncomfortable. Now he just changes the conversation to something else when I try. I've come to the conclusion that us realising that something was wrong is what snapped us back to our reality. If we hadn't, how long would we have been on that highway? Would it have gone on forever, with us blissfully oblivious to the surreal world that we somehow slipped into? My biggest fear is that there was something at the end of that highway. And if we had made it into the end, there would have been no coming back. If anyone has had a similar experience or has heard of one, please let me know. I'm still very disturbed by what happened. It's been over a year since we went back to New Jersey, and I know we're due for another trip very soon with a family reunion on the way, and I'm afraid of it happening again. A few years ago, I lived in a haunted house. I've always been fascinated by the paranormal, and living at this house is what solidified my belief that ghosts and spirits are real. I think it's time to finally share my stories, as I find so much enjoyment in other people's stories. This one's going to be long, so buckle up. A few years ago, I moved to a small town on Vancouver Island, called Tofino. Indigenous peoples had lived there for hundreds of years. But upon civilization, a residential school was built on an island across from the town, which didn't close until 1983. Lots of children died at these schools from malnourishment, physical abuse, lack of medical care, and many suffered horrific sexual abuse from the staff. Currently, the town is now owned by rich people with vacation homes, while the indigenous peoples have been pushed to a reserve outside of town. I believe that the genocide and abuse that took place in that town is the cause of the hauntings. Now that you have some context to the history of the town, I'll start my story. So I arrived in town and right away found a house to live in. I was placed in a makeshift storage room the landlord had made by hammering a big piece of plywood onto the end of the kitchen. My first night sleeping there, 
I remember lying in bed and having the unnerving feeling that I was being watched. I felt the need to sleep facing the wall because it felt like something was looking at me from the doorway. I chalked it up to anxiety from moving to a new town and didn't think much of it. Immediately after moving in, things began to get weird. The first paranormal experience I had living there was about one week after I moved in. My roommate had a friend who was visiting from out of town and sleeping on our couch. In the middle of the night, I'm going to say at around 2 or 3 a.m., I began hearing a knocking and tapping from somewhere in the house. This knocking proceeded to slowly move around the house. I again didn't think much of it and chalked it up to being mice in the wall or some kind of animal. The next morning, my roommate's friend who was sleeping on the couch approached me and asked me if I had heard a tapping sound overnight. She told me that she had heard it beginning in one of my roommate's rooms and was getting annoyed because she didn't understand why he was banging on the wall. She said she distinctly heard the knocking sound move out of the room and into the bathroom. At this point, she went to comfort my roommate because she was annoyed and wanted to go to bed. She approached the bathroom door and could hear the knocking extremely loudly from inside. She knocked on the door and said Phil, and the banging immediately stopped. She waited for a minute for him to reply, and after hearing nothing, opened the bathroom door to find it empty. She actually ended up staying up the entire next night, because she was so freaked out, and left a day early. I asked my roommate about it after her friend left. And she proceeded to let me know that almost every single guest she has ever had a sleepover has asked her the next day if the house is haunted due to some weird experience they've had while staying with us. Over the four months that I lived there, the knocking happened frequently. The most unnerving experience I had with knocking was one night when the knocking came into my room. It proceeded to move around my room and eventually came right next to my head. It was one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced and I just pretended to be asleep because I didn't want to let it be known that I was scared of it. I still have no rational explanation for what could make this sound, especially because it would move around the house from room to room. Another experience I had while living there was when I went to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. As I explained, my bedroom was at the end of the kitchen. I needed to go through the kitchen to get to the bathroom. This is going to sound like some paranormal activity shit, but when I went to go back into my bedroom, about half of the kitchen cabinets had been opened in the span of the minutes I was peeing. I remember them being closed when I left my bedroom, and I didn't hear anyone, extremely old creaky house, come or go from the kitchen while I was in there. Again, I didn't want it to know that I was scared, so I pretended I didn't notice and went to bed. After I had lived there, for two months, a childhood friend of mine from back home moved to Tofino, and she began dating and moved in with my landlord, who lived in the master suites of our house. She told me that on multiple occasions during the night, the bathtub or sink in their ensuite bathroom would turn on full blast. The things also turned on in the bathroom during the night. From what I remember, this is the extent of what she experienced, but I'll follow up some time to ask. I guess the final experience I had living there was one day we decided to have a roommate's meeting about the haunted house. During our meeting, at the exact same time, two of the bedroom doors slammed shut. To be fair, a window was open in one of the rooms, but it seemed so weird that not one, but both doors slammed closed simultaneously during our only meeting we ever had about the house being haunted. Okay, first of all, I want to state that I'm a very skeptical person and don't generally believe things without solid evidence and research. But an experience of mine from when I was a teenager is still unexplainable in my head. When I was younger, me and some of my friends would go and hang out outside. And there's a little playground in my neighborhood where kids and teens in our age group would typically go to hang out at. One day in winter, me and a few of my friends went to this playground 
and were hanging out next to the playground on a slight hill, which was right in front of this walking trail that leads to other parts of the neighbourhood from the playground. It was a very cold day, and there was snow on the ground which we were playing with. We were the only group of people near the playground at that time, until suddenly we all noticed this man walking on the trail right in front of us. It was weird, because from where we were sitting, you could see both ends of the trail extend for over 300 yards. But this man almost seemed to appear completely out of nowhere. Me and the group I was with immediately noticed that and thought it was weird that we didn't notice him walking before he was a few feet away from us, as we were all facing that direction before. We all stopped talking as this man slowly walked past us. He didn't even look at us or acknowledge us as he walked by, but there was something very off about him that I picked up as I was looking at him from a few feet away. He was a very slender man. His skin was as pale as the snow on the ground and almost had a mannequin-like face structure. He was wearing a black fedora type hat with a red ribbon through it and a matching black suit and tie with a red lining on the inside of it. He was also wearing sunglasses, which I thought was particularly weird because the sun was being blocked by the overcast and it was a gloomy looking day. After we walked past us and his back was turned to us, we all turned to each other to whisper what a weird looking guy that was. And how was he not freezing wearing just the outfit when it was below 30 degrees outside? But then, as we were making fun of him, we turned back to get another glimpse of him on the trail before he was gone. We only looked for maybe 30 seconds and there was no possible way anyone could travel the path that fast as he was only maybe 10 feet away from us as we turned to each other. Needless to say, this sort of creeped me and my friends out because we all saw the same guy and we all saw him seemingly vanish, so we left. This happened many years ago but it's still something that bothers me in my head because I just can't explain it. We were not on drugs or drinking or anything, so it didn't make sense. And we all saw him, so I'm not just a crazy person. I was curious about it randomly today and decided to Google it. And I was very surprised to find accounts of people retelling a similar event and claiming it was the hat man. But I don't know. I think this might be different from other people's events as the person I saw didn't meet all of the same descriptions as what other people say online. But does anyone have any thoughts or ideas on an explanation for this? This was the only paranormal thing that ever happened in my life. And it happened shortly after I started working some 20 years ago. My parents and I were living in my brother's house. He had this nice, big ass master bedroom with ensuite bath. Shortly after we got married, he bought another condo and moved out with his wife. My parents didn't want the master bedroom, and so I quite happily snapped it up. I decked it out with a big screen HD TV, a nice glass desk and a big comfy sofa. It was like my own little bachelor suite. One day during the weekend, I was just happily watching TV on my couch. It was daytime and my parents were out. Suddenly, a loud glass shattering sound came from the desk behind me. I instinctively jumped off my couch and turned towards my desk to assess the racket. My desk was made by Ikea. It was an L-shaped desk and was made up of three glass panels with a metal frame. The smallest of the three panels was missing and apparently it had just exploded into tiny bits across half the bedroom floor. I have to stress, it didn't shatter, it exploded. My computer modem was the only thing sitting on the glass before and now it was dangling by its power and phone cables over the desk frame. I touched it, it was barely lukewarm. Nothing could have explained why the glass exploded. I eventually dismissed it as a fluke. Maybe the tempered glass had a structural flaw for manufacturing, I told myself. After a few uneventful weeks, about a month later, I was home alone again, this time at night. I was on my sofa watching some movie. All the lights were off. The only light source was the flickering lights of the TV. Out of the blue, I heard a sound coming from the bathroom to my right. 
The bathroom door was slightly ajar. I couldn't make out the noise at first. The noise stopped. I shrugged it off and kept watching my movie. Less than a minute later, the noise came back. This time, I did recognize it. The hairdryer. My whole body froze. My brain attempted to rationalize it. It was the hairdryer. I usually sat it down beside the sink. It was always plugged in. But this hairdryer had a mechanical sliding switch. There was no way in hell that it could just magically turn on all by itself. This does not compute. With my petrified body, I continued staring blankly at my TV while trying to process it all. Maybe it'll shut off by itself again, I thought to myself. Maybe it's all in my head. But the sound never stopped. Chills started running down my spine. I muted the TV. The sound coming from the bathroom was deafening now. It was the only sound in the absolute silence of the house. I reluctantly turned my head towards the bathroom. All I could see was the door and the darkness that lies beyond the little crack. Fuck, I thought to myself. Fuck. After what it seemed to be an eternity, I mustered up enough courage to stand up and walked over to the bathroom door. I stood there and tried to strategize my next move. My body was in fight or flight mode. My body hair was standing on end. And I very much wanted to get the fuck out of there. There was really no two ways about it. I had to go in and turn off the hairdryer or it could become a fire hazard. My arm felt as if it weighed a ton. I summoned all the strength to lift it up and to open the door with one finger or staying as far away as possible, getting ready to run. Run, are you shitting me? Where to? Can you even run away from whatever lies within? I stood fast while the door swung wide open. I peeked into the dimly lit bathroom with the little light from the TV. Nothing there. But the sound of the hairdryer grew even louder now. I stepped in, turned on the lights and cautiously walked over to the counter, purposefully averting my gaze from the mirror. It's always the mirror, I recalled from the movies. The hairdryer was within arm's reach now. It was roaring aimlessly beside the sink. The vibration reverberated through the wooden frame of the countertop. The swirling warm air didn't help with the chill in my bones. I quickly picked it up and turned it off. The sliding switch was not in some half on half off position. It was solidly in the on position. I looked around, but nothing was out of the ordinary. Nothing funny was in the mirror either. Trust me, I looked. I didn't want to, but I eventually did. Needless to say, I had all the lights turned on in the house until my parents came home that night. I never told them what happened. A week went by. I was again sitting on the couch. Something seemed off. Colours of everything faded and details blurred. It looked like my room, but not my room. My couch, yet not mine. I looked to my right, and there it was. A girl with a stranger's face in her late teens wearing her white sleeping gown, standing in front of the bathroom door. There was no word. She only gave me a little innocent smile, as if she was announcing, yes, it was I in the room, and I'm here just to say hello. Yet, I felt no fear, no evil vibe. All I felt was a sense of peace and calm, perhaps even a dash of bashfulness. Wow, actually, you look quite hot for being a ghost, I said to the ghost girl, not sure what got into me. She gave me a weird stare for my inappropriate comment and didn't utter a word. That's when I woke up and nothing strange ever happened again. I might be the first human being ever to weird out a ghost. And yes, got ghosted by a ghost. This happened years ago when I was still in high school. My cousin and I lived close to each other. Our houses were only two blocks apart and we spent most of our time together. We were the same age and we went to the same school. A lot of the time I would stay the night at their place or she would at ours. To give you a better perspective, my bed was located exactly in front of the door to my room. When you walked in, 
the first thing you would see would be my bed. And whenever she stayed over, either we would share the bed or I would sleep on the bed and she would sleep on the floor. This one particular night, we decided to watch a movie. And because there wasn't enough space for the laptop and our snacks and the blankets and everything, we both put the blankets and everything on the floor next to my bed to have more space. The movie was not that entertaining. And in the middle of it, I slowly fell asleep. I don't know how much time had passed, but sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up. Keep in mind, when I wake up for at least five minutes, I have no clue what's going on around me. I open my eyes and the first thing I see is a figure. I'm not a brave person or anything, but at that moment, I didn't think it was anything or anyone dangerous. I try to see better in the dark, but it's a bit difficult, so I sit up. The figure was standing in the door frame and it looked like it was kind of leaning towards one side of the frame. When I flash my phone towards it, I can see that it's actually my cousin. I asked her why she's up, but she didn't say anything. She just kept standing there leaning on the door frame. One thing that looked really wrong was that she was looking really sad and frustrated. I don't know how to explain the look on my face other than looking sad and hurt while leaning on the door frame. She wasn't answering me and I had no idea what the hell was going on and what she was doing standing there in the middle of the night. Maybe something bad happened to her. Keep in mind this took about 10 seconds before I started to get up to see why she was standing there and not answering me. I put my hand down to get up and immediately knew that this was wrong. I put my hand down on someone. I look down to see that it's my cousin sleeping next to me, deep asleep, not having a clue what was going on. That's when I freaked out. You'd think at that moment you would immediately look up to see what the heck what you saw was. But I was so scared I would rather not look up and see. I was practically shaking, too scared to look up. When I finally looked up, which was probably less than eight seconds later, there was absolutely no one there at the door frame. I talked about this to someone I knew who had paranormal knowledge and he told me that humans have doubles. They look exactly like us, so much that you wouldn't be able to tell they're not who you think they are. Hey, so I've lived in a 90 plus year old house in Kentucky for about six years. And throughout all six years, I've heard weird stuff. I'm almost 18. Now something you should know about me is that I'm skeptical of the paranormal, but I have the philosophy, if I don't fuck with it, it won't fuck with me. There's no reason we can't just be in the same house and leave each other alone. The first thing I heard that really got my attention was four years ago. I was sitting in my basement, which is a repurposed cellar, playing video games on my laptop. I didn't have the sound on, and in the middle of a game of League of Legends, I both feel and hear someone whisper in my left ear. I bolted up the stairs and fast as I could, and later wrote it off as the plumbing making weird noises. I had heard stuff before this, but that was back in middle school, so I don't see that as credible. Recently, maybe a month ago at the start of quarantine, my family was in the extension on the back of my house, which is a two-story tall room with a bunch of windows. At eight or nine-ish, we heard rather heavy footsteps on the roof. There was no possible way someone could have got up there. My mom's reaction was, what the fuck was that, a ghost? I responded, don't go investigate the weird sound. That's how people die in horror movies. She proceeded to go investigate. There's a window that looks out onto that roof in my parents' bathroom, so she ran upstairs to check. She didn't say anything, so we laughed off and said it was probably a ghost. Most recently, I was staying up late in my room, playing video games online with my friends. Around 3am, I feel like I'm being watched. It's that weird feeling where the hair on your neck stands up and you feel almost like a presence nearby. Well, I felt like there was something outside my second story window, about two feet away from me. I looked out and saw nothing. About an hour later, I felt it again and heard the sound of a long scratch on a screen door or like on silk. That sound gives me goosebumps like nails on a chalkboard or styrofoam being rubbed together. So I was like, what the fuck? That was weird. 
and dismissed it as a house noises or night sounds. The next morning I looked out that window and found about an eight inch long rip in the window screen. Back in 2011, my granddad passed away in my nan's home. A week before he passed away, he wanted a new bone bar phone that he saw in a Yours magazine. So my nan ordered it for him. It arrived on the day he passed away. Obviously, my granddad wasn't alive anymore to use his new bone bar phone. So my nan decided to use it as she couldn't return it. But she said she needed a new phone anyway. It was a very weird looking phone. There was more room for the keypad than the actual screen, so you couldn't really use it for texting. So she only used it for calls. Back then, she didn't know how to text on a keypad phone. So she added known mobile number contacts like my mom, brother and family. About two days after my granddad passed away, we were talking about the memories from when he was alive and how much we love and miss him. Then the phone received a text. We all went quiet and then checked the phone. It was a weird number and there was just a blank text. We thought it was a coincidence that the phone went off whilst we were talking about my granddad. But this just didn't happen once. It happened again and again whenever we spoke about him. And it was from the same number with just a blank message. I believe it was my granddad showing signs that he was still there and wanting us to know he'll never leave. It freaked me out, but still gave me comfort. I then experienced something else that was spooky. My nan has a china cabinet she still owns from 20 plus years ago and it has a built-in mirror inside it. I was brushing my hair in the mirror, then behind me I saw my granddad sitting in the chair he passed away in, just smiling at me. I was only young so I obviously froze and got really freaked out, to the point I ran to my mom and nan crying. They didn't believe me at first but now they know I wouldn't make something up I've mentioned for years since it's happened. I still mention it to this day. We kept receiving texts for three years after my granddad passed and bearing in mind, this only happened whenever we spoke about him. Until my nan decided to get a new phone and SIM card. She switched the phone off and kept it in a drawer ever since. The text tone always gave me some feeling of comfort but still makes me shiver a bit. Many years later, I found out it was a very famous EDM song called Children by Robert Miles. Whenever I hear the song, it always brings back memories and gives me some sort of comfort, yet a spooky feeling. I found the phone today. It's currently charging, but I think he's moved on. We haven't received a sign ever since. My mom told me the story about my great grandfather when I was younger, and I often tell it around campfires now that I'm older. One day, as it was reaching dusk, my great grandfather was on his way home in the countryside of Japan, and the quickest way there was straight through a large empty field. He started on the path, and as he made his way down, he noticed two well dressed men and started to follow them. He looked forward and continued on. A few more paces and he looked back. The two men were much closer than before. It was as if they teleported. There was no way they could have gotten that close that fast at the pace they were walking. My grandfather sped up his pace before checking behind himself again. The two businessmen had closed a huge amount of distance again and were nearly directly behind my grandfather. At that point he could hear their footsteps closing in when, out of nowhere, a dog appeared. My grandfather looked back for the two businessmen, who at that point should have been right on top of him, but they'd vanished. He looked around for any sight of them, but the field was completely empty, with no place for them to have disappeared to. He looked down to the dog and felt that the men slash spirits disappeared due to its presence. He continued the rest of the way home with the dog never straying from his side. As my grandpa walked through the door of his house, he told my great grandma to get a saucer of milk for the dog waiting outside. She grabbed the milk, but in the same time it took her to do so, the dog vanished just like the two men. My family is convinced that the dog was a spirit who protected my grandfather 
from whoever or whatever those two men were. This is a story from when I was about six or seven. One of my old neighbors used to babysit some of my kids my age in the summers. Since they were about my age and the only boys on my street, I would always go over to see them. My neighbor's house is right on the edge of a small forested area and there are tons of trees and areas to hide in. There was also a small path cutting right through the wooded area. So sometimes people would go through my neighbor's yard to get to it. One time I was playing with my friends in my neighbor's yard when I looked over at one of the trees. I saw a dark black figure, not like the race black, but shadow black, standing beside it. The figure was pitch black, no facial features, no clothing, nothing. And he wasn't see-through like a shadow is, he was pitch black. He ducked behind the tree before I could get a better look. I told my mom about it, but she didn't think much of it since I was so young. A few months later, I was riding my bike past my neighbor's yard. I looked over at the trees and sure enough, he was there. I stared at him for a moment before looking back in front of me, hit the curb and scraped up my knee. When I looked back, he was gone again. This is the last story I have about him. About a year after I first saw him, me and my sister were in my backyard playing on our playset. All of a sudden, I heard my mom yelling for me to grab my sister and come in. My sister was like three or four at the time. I grabbed her and ran back in, but just before I got inside, I glanced over at the fence. And there he was, staring at me and my sister. I asked my mom why she called us in, and she told us it was because she saw the man too, and thought he was some creep or something. She described it exactly as I had. I never saw him again. Nowadays, I still don't know if it was some sort of spirit or just some type of creepy dude that I happened to see multiple times. My sister was too young to really remember him, but me and my mom still talk about it till this day. Our family has always been sensitive to the paranormal. When my mom was young, she was tormented by a force that would slam doors, turn off lights, and once even slapped her cheek. For my case, I've had instances of seeing shadow figures being grabbed and pushed through a doorway, but my younger sister had the worst instance. When she was five, she got locked in her bedroom, which is weird because the doors have no way of locking, either with a key or those pressure turn handles. She screamed for us to help and we couldn't open the door. Finally, my dad broke the door open to find her crying in a fetal position under the bed. When we asked what happened, she refused to tell us. She refuses to sleep in pitch black and is very skittish around dark places in general. That was seven years ago and we still have strange occurrences happening. It doesn't matter whether we're in our house or away in a hotel, we always have unexplainable experiences that are terrifying. My family is devoutly Christian. We go to church every Sunday and are very involved in personal spiritual growth. We've done everything to try and stop these paranormal activities happening. We've had pastors pray over the house, burned sage, prayed as a family to stop, and even had a Catholic priest perform an exorcism on the house. Nothing works. This isn't just my family's problem though. All the way back to my great grandmother, there have been strong supernatural occurrences. Even three generations back, they couldn't get rid of whatever demon haunts our bloodline. The final straw happened last week. My younger sister stayed home alone while the rest of the family went to an activity. She was staying in her room on the second story. Suddenly, she heard heavy footsteps above her in the attic. She got scared, but didn't panic, as this happens semi-frequently. The footsteps stopped, and then she heard a man's voice yell her name. She stayed in her room and just ignored it. The voice yelled again, but was outside her door. She just assumed it was my dad and ripped the door open to see what was up. She didn't see anything but felt a hand grab her shoulder. Because we've been dealing with this, we usually handle these extreme cases with a few biblical phrases. She held out a crucifix and yelled, 
In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave this house. That must have angered her because she got three long fingernail type scratches on her back. She freaked out and ran out of the house. My parents came home later and said they felt cold and hateful when they went into her room. So a little bit of backstory. First, my fiance Jay and I had gotten a kitten together and we loved him with everything. And tragically, we lost him too young due to an accident. We were obviously very broken and distraught. We think he was still here. We could hear his little squeak. Random things would get battered across the living room. We would just feel a presence. Recently, we got another kitten, T. We weren't looking for one, but an abandoned four-week-old kitten showed up and needed a home, so we took him in. We stopped noticing anything unusual, other than maybe T would start acting like he was playing with someone, but nothing directed at us. Now for the whole wholesome encounter. We sleep with our new kitten in this crate yet in our room. The other night, we were both sound asleep. Then I woke up to the feeling of a kitten walking over me, my pillow, and towards the cubby in the headboard. So I reached for my flashlight to look for our kitten and think, why did Jay let him out of his crate in the middle of the night? Then Jay said, I lost him, where is he? I shined my flashlight everywhere and T wasn't on the bed. We then checked the crate. There he was, sleeping so soundly, the door closed. So back to sleep we went. The next morning I was telling Jay how weird it was that we both thought it was out of the crate and on the bed. I thought he let him out. He thought I let him out. Jay told me he felt a kitten climb over him to the middle of the bed. We stopped and looked at each other and realised what it was. It wasn't tea. It wasn't a simultaneous dream. It must have been our first kitten just walking over us to go to bed. I was so happy he decided to visit us again. He's welcome any time. So this was one of the strangest, most intense experiences of my life. I've rarely spoken of it just because it felt so surreal. One time, I had driven out of town with a friend to a beach town for the day. We decided to go get a drink before going down to hang out at the beach. I think we both got iced tea and sat outside the little cafe. The little, old, seeming, seemingly homeless lady walked by, and honestly, I would never have noticed if she hadn't stopped. She grabbed my arm, and when I looked at her, she had these eyes. I can't even describe them. I've never seen eyes like that in my life. Don't think I ever will. They saw. I felt exposed. She told me, there's a storm coming. Life is about to get very, very hard for you. You're going to want to give up. And you might, but you shouldn't. You'll be given strength. It will all end up okay. Just hold on. Something to that effect. Because I'm certain that's what she said. But, you know, memories are not reliable. At this point, for some strange ass reason, my friend and I are flat out crying. It was just so intense, I do not know how to begin to explain what washed over us. The waiter came and shooed her away. Before she left, she turned and she said, My name is Isabel. My heart damn near stopped. She walked away. The waiter apologised to us. And what was odd is he also looked confused. He said he hadn't seen her in the area before. It isn't abnormal for this to happen in that area and the place I lived. There is a high homeless population. The thing is, the same ones typically stick around the same areas, so it was off that he never had. Not a biggie, but interesting. Now the two things that made this experience paranormal, or rather spiritual, are that one, I proceeded to have the two hardest years of my life. I did give up. I flat out gave up, but somehow in some way I survived and got my shit back together, and even moved to a new country and started an amazing life. Things aren't perfect, but if you told me that this would be my life in that two year period, I would never have believed you. And two, a very, very close relative I had lost and been dreaming about was named Isabel. I've always found it off that she didn't open with that. 
Why did she wait until the end to say it? I'll never know. However, she made sure to say it. I've always wondered if that lady was even a human being. The only person I shared this with was my dad, right after the fact, and he also got that overwhelmed feeling and cried as well. He was speechless and convinced it was an angel. I'll never forget how he said goodbye to me on that phone call. Well, I guess we need to brace ourselves then, huh? If only he knew what was coming next. Good God. So it's been pretty clear since a young age that my house is haunted. I saw deceased pets walking around the place, felt the weight and smelt the scent of my old dog on my bed multiple times. My dead nan visited me in dreams. There were writings on the ceiling of my bedroom. I even had my own personal demon for months until I was finally able to banish it. However, it's been a few years since I've had a true paranormal experience in my own home. Recently, I've been seeing things out of the corner of my eye, just black shapes moving quickly out of sight. Tonight, I'm home alone for the first time in months. My partner isn't here, my parents are on holiday, and my sister is with her partner at his house. I'm currently taking a break in a now brightly lit room from shutting all the curtains and turning out the lights. Our house is a three story Victorian esque house. It's old. The attic was converted into a bedroom for my parents before I was born, I believe. My bedroom is to the left, at the foot of the stairs leading up into their room. There's also a landing window at the foot of their stairs, just before they turn out into the hallway. So I had the lights on at the foot of their stairs. I'm a coward, sue me. And I shut the curtains and just turned to shut off the lights, when a black, cat-sized shape darts up the stairs past me. I call both my cat's names and just hear a meow from my room, my cat. And my sister's cat ends up being at the foot of the stairs on the bottom floor of the house. I went upstairs with a flashlight and checked the room out and nothing but a warm patch and a cat imprint at the foot of my parents' bed. So I'm thinking I'm probably just my deceased cat, Jay, coming for a visit. Hopefully. It goes back to when I was eight. My mom, older brother and I moved into a small house. One night after dinner, I was looking down the hallway from the front door and I saw a dark figure. It almost resembles what the Grim Reaper would look like, except this thing had a sinister and evil grin on its face. It stared at me, walked into my brother's room. I never saw it leave the room. I'm 23 now and I never have seen it again. I was eight at the time. I told my mom and sobbed because I was scared at what I had just seen. I came from a very religious family, so my mom prayed over the house and everyone in it. About a year later, at night time, I began to see black shadow figures with no faces. They would be around my bed at night and I would sleep with the covers over my head. But every night they would be there. When I was 12, I would have sleepovers and my cousin would stay the night. She would see the dark shadow figures as well. We would run to the living room and try to watch TV and forget about it. We were scared and we didn't know what to do. When I hit my teens, my mom and I moved into a house. This house had an attic and it was very large compared to the house we had lived in before. Every night when I would lay in bed, I would hear what I can only describe as someone walking around the attic or knocking boxes around. We checked for rats and other things like raccoons many times but we never found anything in the attic. But this sounded like someone stomping around the attic at night. We never found anything. One day, after doing laundry, my mom hung up the clothes to dry in the laundry room, since the dryer was broken at the time. The next day she went to check out the clothes to dry. A large clot of grape jelly was smeared all over one of the shirts. I didn't do it. My mom didn't do it. No one else was in our house. We don't even know how to explain that one. Another incident was when my cousin came to stay the night. She heard a child crying in the court hallway one night. She got up to check what it was and the crying immediately stopped, she said. She told me about it the next morning and I was freaked out. No one had been up crying. I could go on and on, 
but that would be a lot to, to say. I don't know how to explain any of this. My mom still lives in the second house and we still have paranormal activity going on in it that we can't explain. I'm open to hearing your guys' inputs and thoughts.